I'm here. Okay, Michelle. <laughs> Hi. Hi. All right. Uh, so maybe we can um, try to find my agenda here. We'll start off with roll call. Okay. Director Jones. Present. Director McLaughlin. Here. Director Bernstein. Director Bernstein, your microphone. We'll give Director Bernstein a moment. Director yes, Crawley. Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Present. Oh, okay. So we have Director Bernstein. Director Crawley. Is present. present. Okay. Thank you. And Director Solano. Here. So uh, call for um, oh roll call pledges of allegiance. <laughs> so I pledge allegiance to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America and to the to Republic, Republic which, which is the hands, hands, one nation, one nation under God. God. Indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you can be seated now. Uh, we'll uh, just wanted to um, uh, report out, uh, report to you that, uh, and many of you probably already know, that we did not have a closed session meeting today. Therefore, there are no reportable action items to report. So we'll move on uh, now to item number two, public comment number two. Yes, Director Jones, we have one public comment, if you'll give me one moment. Okay, Lynn, uh, I think you're ready to talk now. Lynn, thank you for calling. Are you muted? Lynn? Hold on, let's try this one more time. Uh, you gotta mute yourself, Lynn. I'm new. There you go. All right. I think she's ready, Michelle. Right, Lynn, can you uh, can you hear us? Can you speak? Um, what's going on there? Um. Hello. She's she's able to talk. She's not on mute. So um, we'll just uh, give her a second or two. And, now, and why don't we? Your microphone does not. Not we'll come roll back around to this. Uh, Chuck, you have her have a phone number. Call her. Let her know she's on. Now she's muted again. I, I will try. I will call her right now. Thanks. Uh, so if it's, she's all commuted again. President Jones, there, there is another public comment sec session in the meeting and there would be no problem from my perspective under the Brown Act if um, Ms. Bramlin wanted to offer her public comment during that period instead of this one. Okay, that sounds good. Doesn't seem like we're able to make this connection. Uh, Lynn, are you okay? Is, she, is Lynn okay with doing that? I think she should be, but you might want to check with her. How, how can we do that? You're gonna would you call her? Uh, I think Director Bernstein is uh, attempting to reach her. Oh, he's speaking with her. Let's just see what, what's going on. I, I think we probably need to move on. We can always uh, interrupt it. In, I think any given time, right, Steve, to, to allow her to, to voice her uh, public comment? There is no problem with having public comment anywhere you so choose. Okay, so why don't we do that since so there's some technical difficulties going on, and I see she's back on mute now. She's, so let's move on to item... Uh, number one, uh, and if it's okay with the board, we'll circle back around as soon 
as Lynn uh, was, is able to, to get some audio. So let's move on to the report uh, of the Chief of uh, Fire Chief for discussion and direction. Chief? Yeah, Director, uh, good evening to everybody. So I just sent you a, uh, an update. If you haven't got a chance to look at it, it's, it's actually modified what I put in the Chief's report just to give you the most recent information on both uh, wildland fire deployments and then the urban search and rescue program, and then what's going on with the triangle homeless encampments. Uh, I'll start with the wildland deployments, obviously um, ongoing, a lot going on. Uh, you know, our units came back a week ago. Uh, I give the shop a lot of credit, and the firefighters a lot of credit, you know, to rehab the units, the equipment, put them through the shop where they get checked. And to get everything ready to go again is, is, you know, on short turnaround is always a big undertaking, let alone all the personnel that are going out on the, on the fire line. Uh, on the CZU fire, as it said, we had uh, most all the resources that were out, even on different fires, were eventually brought into that one or released, meaning that we had a, an engine company as part of a strike team, strike team leader. Uh, assistant strike team leader and a task force, which was uh, four wheel drive units, pretty much on opposite sides of the fire. And then single resources um, for us, typically that's EMTs and paramedics out on the fire line with uh, hand crews. And then we did some support for Ben Lomond and Boulder Creek. There's some letters attached to the chief's report there from Ben Lomond and more to come from uh, Boulder Creek because they have an ongoing issue there. Uh, even today, I was looking and talking to uh, Carl Custon, who's over there about that. But more immediately for the, once the engines, everything was turned around, uh, we got almost everybody back until this last weekend. And then we had another blow up, as you know, in the state, this time with the heat and the wind and just other fires. Um, so most of the, if you read what I just sent you, we have seven, uh, we did have eight, we have seven personnel out currently. Uh, all of them are in the North complex. That's the big fire. Uh, started out, I think at least one part of it was the Bear Fire up around Oroville and has subsequently now turned into a complex fire. And we sent out uh, a strike team engine with four personnel and uh, three other personnel that are serving as either line EMTs or paramedics. Uh, in addition to that, I'll jump down to USAR. Uh, we were lucky, the states kind of put a moratorium on the task forces throughout the state leaving. That was a bit of a surprise. Um, I think a little bit more understood in the last hurricane with Laura. I think the new one is Sally, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, yeah. That's, you know, it's now it's becoming, I think it's sinking in a little bit more. Uh, we were pulled for an HRD, Human Remains Discovery Team, five personnel, two of which are dogs. Um, not all personnel coming from our, our department, but kind of a rainbow team from the task force typically, right? And that was denied to go to Oregon. I think everybody could kind of understand that given the fact that we knew the same sort of thing was going on up in the Oroville area and burn over there and people being looked for in Butte County, which is similar to what we did up in, during the Paradise Fire um, or Camp Fire. But, uh, you know, we were able to send a dog. Sacramento has an agreement with us that if they don't have enough dogs or we don't have enough dogs uh, or doctors or engineers, we can share those resources and we did. Um, so as a task force, we actually, I guess, were lucky because we sent one person on an overhead team, uh, Joe Cravello out of San Jose, went to the Hurricane Laura and was on an instant support team for that. One of only three allowed to go from the state. And then, uh, you know, Tim Howling out of Mountain View. And I think George is the dog. You may have seen or heard about him before during the campfire, got beat up pretty good. Uh, they're both loaned out to Sacramento Task Force 7, as it says. And they're up working the, uh, the site, as far as I know at this point, in, uh, in Oroville or the Oroville area. So um, the chiefs have talked about this. You know, obviously right now is not a time to really make a big deal out of it, but we're all trying to understand, you know, meeting both the federal obligations as well as the state obligations and, you know, understanding 
that uh, these are unprecedented times with you know multiple fires a agencies overwhelmed in some cases and people responding in from all over the world to California. But uh, just so you know, we're balancing, as we always do, all of those, um, specifically local need always first, and then uh, you know state, uh, wildland, and urban search and rescue task force commitments. And we've been doing a lot of surveying. I think I've shared with you, we're up and we're down in terms of availability. During the CZU, when we were literally surrounded by, you know, LZ, LSU and the other fires, you know, that's when we took the team down just because everybody was committed uh, because of all the fires surrounding the Bay Area. We're, we're, I think a lot of units have come available, agencies have normalized to some degree, and we're lucky to have a multi-agency team and a large group of civilians that help us staff the team as well. So, you know, I think that, that I wouldn't say makes us unique, but it certainly allows us to do more than one thing at one time, not always having to rely on just Menlo Park Fire District, uh, even though obviously we're the mainstay for the team. Um, last thing outside of what's in here, and you, you know, you can, I'll just go to the things that I sent you. Uh, the task force system, and I'll let Director Jones, if you want to say something, you can too. You're obviously involved with this. The task force process for the city of Menlo Park, I think is working to do what it was intended to do with homeless encampments, specifically the triangle, as we call it, the 60 acre site out on Bayfront, Willow University and along the back of Adams. Um, it's not always an easy meeting and it's a once a month meeting, but I, what's happened is it's drawn in all the players now to hopefully resolve some of these issues. And if not resolve them, at least have some meaningful dialogue and you know, all of us to learn about you know, different sides of homeless problems, right? From housing to COVID to you know, real incidents that we're going through. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's been, a, I think a, for me, at least a good experience. And I think we've finally broken through the Caltrans issue. And I got to be careful because I don't want to blame them. But it seems like we weren't getting any help from them for a while. Um, that's changed now. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff always changes when it gets to the right people. So at the end of the day, you know, when it gets to the right people, obviously, then then things start to happen. So that's the letter that I just sent you to Deborah. Uh, as you can see, she's one of the primary, or we'll see if you read it. One of the Hello. primary. What? I thought somebody said something. She's they one did. Of, yeah. I don't know who it was, but they said something. Somebody Go yelled. Ahead, <laughs> um, so she's one of the primary players at Caltrans on this issue. We're, we're, start, we're starting to finally make some progress um, with this whole issue. And, and that's a good thing because if you look at the data that I sent you, we're up to 41 fires this year. Wow. It's gotten worse from 2017, 18, 19. It's just progressively getting worse. In the last month, we had 10 fires. And actually on the 10th of September, on the eve of 9-11, we had three fires in one day. Uh, we have not looked at how many resources are being deployed out there. We're going to do that. Time on task is obviously an issue. But the great thing that Deborah provided after months of asking for this and it being brought up, it was this almost secretive criteria that the state was using to, in some cases, I'm sorry if this is insulting to anybody that's listening or hears this, but abdicate themselves of doing really nothing. I don't feel like Deborah is that person, but I certainly felt that others were doing that and using, you know, a multi-year problem. This isn't something new, but certainly has, you know, grown and in epic proportions around the Bay Area to send us what they're actually referencing, the three criteria, which I sent you of why Caltrans, CHP, the state, has decided to do nothing or very little under certain circumstances about this problem. And, and you know, as I hopefully 
you'll see in the letter, and I've shared on the existing one that was on there too, where I say it was going the wrong way. When you get 10 fires in a month, you're going the wrong way. You get three fires in a day, you're going the wrong way. When the firefighters are out there treating people in the homeless encampments, but somehow we want to use the cover of COVID to not touch anybody or act as if they're not going to be exposed to people in the camps. And to be honest with you, is this really like the most compassionate way to address the problem is just to turn almost a blind eye to it so that it's exploded everywhere. I mean, it's not, it's not the way I think anybody sees that it, it should be done. And, you know, again, selfishly from the fire district standpoint, puts our people at risk. And that's not fair to them. That's not fair to the communities that we protect and it needs to be addressed. So I finally have it. We're working on it. I give, again, I give Deborah and others on the task force a lot of credit. They're not always easy conversations. They're certainly not easy answers, but this is the only place that I'm aware of where we're trying to do a multi-prong approach to actually solve it. Um, yeah. I hear about it in other communities. I don't necessarily see that it gets better. I read about it in the paper. You know, we definitely have the environmental issues too here that add a level of complexity. And also uh, in some cases, you know, I would say neglect because again, this is not new, this is a multi-year thing, but I think we finally figure out who to talk to, what to talk about, and we're on the right path, despite the fact that we're going the wrong way when it comes to the number of incidents. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions and anything See, else that you want to talk about in the report. If you may, uh, I wanted to just add a footnote to, to all that you said. I think from my perspective, it, it being at the meeting, I, it, it, Caltrain, if I heard correctly, she correct me if I'm wrong, indicated that they are willing um, and ready to move the tenants, and I say tenants, the homeless homeless uh, individuals, out of that particular area somewhere else. They will support that that effort. Uh, and 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 I think the bottleneck is going to be on there. The bottleneck is where are they going to move them to in Menlo Park? Who wants them in their back yeah. door? I mean, and, where and then do they even want to go? Because some clearly don't. Exactly. And you know, as we discussed, you know, the other problem was the fencing has been broken down, and with the fires that have burned off the vegetation, so those that was impediment for movement although, you know, cover, right? Um, we've actually found, I was out there and witnessed a vehicle with a trailer full of lumber. I mean, literally we're building and bring in building materials to build more or more elaborate encampments. And, you know, the other aspect of this too, and now it's been confirmed by the third parties that are assisting the homeless directly is use of fire as a weapon purposely burning each other out, which, you know, I, again, I think all of you can understand the tragic consequences that can occur with that. Um, I mean, what, how far do we let it go before somebody gets killed? And that was, if you go back and some of the data I've provided before, especially that homeless encampment in East Palo Alto, where we found after the grass fire, we traced it back to someone that had been murdered in an encampment and fire was trying to be used to conceal that. So, you know, that that's the real world we live in, we'll, we're dealing with, and it just needs to get addressed. And again, I'm, I feel a lot better that even though it's going the wrong way, it's going the right way when it comes to bringing everybody to the table and the severity of what we're dealing with and totality of it, so. The one last Robert. thing I would say on this, if I may, I got your hand. Let me just say this before I forget, you know, I forget it easy these days. It was related to what uh, the last point that I want to make and why the board is so important. I think the board, one, we have a dilemma. We got a firefighters going out there in harm's way when they, when they go to some encampment and, and it's a never ending situation. One of the things that, that 
of interest that I tried to introduce again at the last, at the meeting was, you know that, that 60 acres or most of 60 acres beside the, the, the privately held uh, uh, site is uh, in a, a reserve, uh, Don Edwards Preserve. Uh, mm -hmm. And so 60 acres is covered under that and that's most of the site. Somewhere along the line, I think, I know that right now there's no political will to try to even explore the opportunity of being able to try to, uh, as a long-term solution, to look at the site, at least a, a portion of the site, 68, uh, you know, one acre of the site as a, as a permanent solution. It can be closer to the Facebook side, wherever that is, carving that out, creating the type of type of housing and, 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 and connected services that the homeless would need and, and managed by the city or managed by the county uh, as a permanent solution. It could be a transitional place, but something of that nature really needs to be, be get, uh, need to happen, I think, and that's just personal opinion. And that's why I think somewhere along the board, uh, if, if board members need to, uh, familiarize yourself with what's going on out there and see what you can do, who you can connect at the state level, uh, at some of these preserves, at this Don Edwards place, to try and try to talk to them about, is there a, a, a manageable solution that we can have where the preserve still stayed in, in place, but you still this, this piece that, this housing piece, this, this tiny housing kind of piece for the homeless, uh, transitional that can take place as well. Um, with a good architect and good planning, all of the, both the, the little mouse that's out there and, and the little tumbleweed that's, that's, that's uh, endangered, all of that can stay uh, intact uh, and coexist, uh, which it has been with uh, human habitats uh, in terms of displaying the human need. Virginia? Carol, can you please remind me who's on this task force? Because I didn't see it in the report, but I, I may have missed it. I, I bet I looked again. Yeah, so the task force was started by the city of Mellow Park. So it's the mayor, uh, Cecilia Taylor, and Ray Mueller as a council member. Um, and then their police chief or someone from law enforcement's involved. Uh, the California Highway Patrol, specifically the Redwood City Division, even though, believe it or not, that's the Hayward Division's area. So we finally got that all sorted out, which was a big deal for the safety of our personnel to work out there. Um, Caltrans, uh, first the maintenance people, now obviously the actual, which I didn't know exist, uh, homeless task force folks and others that are representative, like public relations people. Uh, from the district, you have President Jones as, my, as, the, as the elected representative, and then myself as the fire chief. Um, we just added um, Kim, uh, who's obviously one of our inspectors that's out there the most frequent. Uh, and uh, the fire marshal, uh, John Johnson, has been out there and has continued to go out there as well. So John's intimately involved. And they're taking on and have been doing more of the field and represented from the as representatives from the fire district and then you have three different churches and a number of uh, non-governmental entities uh, you know we hope um, I forget some of the other married in house you got yeah, married house, house life moves you know there's a number of people that are out there uh, both the county uh, in terms of homeless I think someone from the city now that's out there, I forget, you know, all, but it's, it's been a growing list. And then invited was uh, representatives from the business community that abuts that. Uh, Facebook has skin in the game because property they own. Um, uh, Kavanaugh, O'Brien, and Tarleton families have businesses and business impact right there. I think they invited City of East Palo Alto since obviously it also impacts them but you know it's been a growing list as meetings have gone on um, in terms of you know what what the outreach has been and who's involved and it's been like i said i think it's been helpful from the standpoint of getting everybody in one place to have a discussion i got to give a shout out to uh we hope uh they as you know they did a great thing 
and uh, offering assistance to the uh, Boulder Creek Fire Department. In fact, they're still up there with their uh, shower unit and laundry washing uh, unit working with the volunteer fire department up there in support of them. I think they're there through Friday, but they've been up there for several weeks. And Pastor Baines, and I know Director Jones has been talking to him separately about the housing issue. You know, there's a lot of effort being put on that end to identify, you know, where people can go. Not just to throw people out or move them somewhere else, because that's part of what we're suffering through is the movement from Redwood City into this area, which is part of the problem, as we believe too, but to try and find the solutions necessary for some level of permanence. That's not to say, you know, look, mental health, drug dependency, other, you know, alcohol dependency, there's criminality, there's a lot of stuff going on when we deal with these camps. So, you know, we're never gonna have a perfect solution, but, but you know, trying to at least get our arms around it and address it proactively is obviously something we're pushing for. So I hope that explains it. Thank Cal, you. Caltrans, Caltran, it, 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 what I left with, they have the resources to move them somewhere. Uh, the city of Miller Park just got to figure out where, uh, and it's only going to be for a short term. So once that's over, they're going to be, I guarantee, going back over at the site. Yeah. So that, that's the problem we got to solve. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thanks. And, we're, and we're not alone. You know, I mean, I think everybody realizes, home, you know, homelessness uh, and these encampments are a bigger problem, not only here all around the state, but certainly in the region. Um, you know, and I don't. I don't profess to being able to solve everybody's problem, let alone ours, you know, other than to tackle it, right? To try and at least get our arms around it and then progressively work to some ends that will benefit hopefully some of these people, but you know, it needs to be addressed. And I think, you know, like I said, we're doing that. Um, I will be, as you'll see with the criteria the state gave me, I will be sharing that with other fire agencies, no different then when we did uh, legislation for the bridges, when we found out under fast track, we were all receiving citations for response. So, you know, I mean, there's, there's ways, I think, once you include the partners, including law enforcement, which has not been done, I think some of these policy changes, which I referenced in there too, become, they look a little bit different when you bring different people in that see it from a different angle. We certainly see it from the ground Everything yeah. is a problem. So it's a, it's a, it, 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 it takes up resources. It puts people at risk. And, uh, you know, that's, that's how we're approaching it, including, again, and I got to emphasize, trying from the compassionate side to resolve the actual issue itself. As, as so Harold, Harold, do you think that um, your presence and um, your ideas and your comments or in, in input are effective i mean because quite frankly you know this has been going on for what since july and so it, it's not a new situation and, and it could actually get worse and i just i think that if there's anyone who's an expert in understanding you know the dangers and the wildfire dangers and the risks it would be you so i'm hoping that they're you know taking your advice seriously as the fire chief because which you are well, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there. That's a lot. It, um, I know, but I mean, it's a very simple let, question. Let me, I mean, well, I just... Yeah, let me, let me say this. Uh, so, well, you know, I'd like to hear <coughs> Harold, Robert. Yeah, yeah let me just say this. Hear from, but you're going to hear from me, too, after he talks. Okay, perfect. All right, let me, let me just say okay this, you. right? Yeah. We, live in, we live in an imperfect world, right? And, you know, I think... I think a, there's a lot of well-intended effort and even protocols that are sometimes put in place, but there's unintended consequences if you don't involve people that have to address the problem. You know, I, I could go macro on fires and wildland as you just brought up, right? I don't want to go political because that's equally a problem. But Yeah, exactly. You know, that's why I, just, I want to make sure that you're being listened to. Well, I think I'm being listened to, but you know, I'm also, look, I'm gonna be very honest, I'm an antagonist when it comes to this because it's a real issue. So I, I'm not quiet about it, you know that. Right. And, you know, I try and bring attention to it because it's an important issue. 
and it's only getting worse. So it's not as if, you know, we're not wallflowers. I don't feel like we're being marginalized, minimized. You know, I, I think if anything, we brought a lot to the game, if you want to call it that, or the issue, because it's a big deal. And I think a lot of people had no clue what was really going on out there and how bad it is. So, you know, and it's not acceptable. It needs to be solved. And you know what? It's a very, very, it's a societal problem. It's very difficult. So I don't come with all the solutions because it's not fully in our power to do that. But I think by bringing everybody to the table, it's become, I think it's become more understandable for a lot of people. It certainly helped me to understand what level of outreach is being done out there. And there's a lot of great work and I gotta tell you, great people that are trying to help out here. I mean, I, I applaud them. I mean, I've, I'm impressed and I'm not always very impressed. So, you know, I think the part two that was unknown for them was how many agencies were duplicating effort. They didn't even know they were all helping out because if you go out there at different times, you come in from different places, you know, there wasn't a cohesive um, forum for everybody to have the dialogue that's going on. That's why I say, I gotta tell you, you know, kudos to Cecilia Taylor, because I think it was her idea to put this together. I don't think even she envisioned <clears throat> where we're at. And sometimes I know it's difficult for the city too, because the city's being put on the spot to find answers. And to be honest with you, they don't have the answers. So, you know, it's uncomfortable for them too. I think it's uncomfortable for all of us, but you got to push past the uncomfortable to tragic. I'm trying to avoid tragic, okay, consequences. Right. I've been there, seen that, and we're on the road for that to happen. And so I don't want a firefighter getting hurt. I don't want a homeless person getting killed or severely injured. And so, you know, we have to solve these problems despite the fact that they're monumental, monumental. And there's not a lot of easy answers. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Carol. You bet. All right. Uh, any other questions for the chief? Then we'll move on to item Bob, I, I had, uh, uh, Chief. Robert, I had some questions. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. Chief, I have three questions about... Chuck, Chuck. You're on you? mute, Chuck. You're on mute. Okay, thank you. Um, Chief, I, wanted to, I have three questions I wanted to ask. Um, the first one relates to the wildland fire deployment, the first item there. You mentioned that um, <clears throat> in the fire, they, they suspended, they had some flight restrictions on drones. It, has, have we seen that in the past? It seems weird that they would just stop drone flights. Well, you know, again, I, I could go long on this, but I'll try and cut, since you got three questions that were early in the meeting, let me just say this. It's not unusual because you're, you're dealing with a dynamic environment where suppression aircraft, helicopters, rotary wing and fixed wing are being used to combat the fire. There is not a coalescence, nor is there an unconflicted airspace agreement. Um, we've been successful with doing that with Coast Guard. I think, as you know, we have agreements with the Coast Guard, how to operate over the bay. We're in discussions with the California Highway Patrol to do a similar agreement. And we've been working for three years under fire scope where our personnel are actually the chair of a committee on UAS drones to try and resolve this conflicted airspace, coalescence, you know, how do we all work together as public safety problem? And so once they put a blanket uh, TFR in, uh, flight restrictions basically, um, we're not flying unless they give us exceptions to do that. Sometimes, like I think I referenced, that's been done at Yosemite for a while and fire at night, all the way in the early morning hours. It's been done during the camp car and tubs fires for us to do damage assessment. Um, John uh, Johnson and I just discussed this tonight. He was talking to Chris Denebaugh. We believe 
that with the air quality improving, uh, that it's dropped for the CZU fire, which is over 90% containment, and that we probably can go up and at least assist them with damage assessment. But, you know, why this is a, a more difficult problem is you, you have you have fixed wing and, and rotary wing and nobody wants to get in their way, let alone it's a process to resolve how do you do all this and not have a problem. So it's it's ongoing. I, yeah, I got to tell you, what I think someday we'll, we'll deal with, this will all get cleaned up and you're going to see a lot more autonomous flights day and night doing water drops and no longer have you know, manned aircraft or it won't be as necessary. Um, I think technology is going to eventually fix this problem. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is down in the National Urban and Search Rescue Program, you make reference to three overhead incident support team responders. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you what overhead means. Does that mean that up above you or does that mean like they're office people or something yeah so let me go oh, that's a great question sorry it's not clear so above the task force is when i say that in every team and when we go out typically for one of the first things sent out is an ist instant support team so it's a management team there's three in the country they're called the red white and blue teams i actually used to be on the blue team we've got members currently on uh, at least two of the three um, actually a number of retired personnel too from different fire agencies because it's a great way to still continue their service and not really impact our deployment. So uh, the instant support team personnel come from across the country on a 20 plus member team. Uh, a number of those, like I said, are retired, but some are active duty. Uh, Joe Crivello from San Jose Fire Department is on one of those people is on one of the teams. He was one of three. The other two were not from our team, not from our department, not from uh, any local department who responded. And what was why I bring that up was that was the only thing that Cal OES allowed to leave the state for Hurricane Laura. So I was glad we actually got somebody who could go. Um, as you can imagine, you know, I always worry about when the federal government's given us $1.2 million a year, I like them to see that Cal 3 is meeting its obligations for response. And so, you know, having that, I think bodes well if uh, we come under scrutiny as to our participation, let alone ability to support mission requests simultaneously with a lot of other things going on. So, you know, the same goes for the dog, the dog handler, as I mentioned, Tim out of Mountain View Fire. Um, again, they're not always going to be Menlo Fire personnel, which is great. That's, I think that's a great thing because it reflects on the multi-dimensional uh, team that we have. Thank you. I just didn't understand the words exactly. Yeah, last, I've done a better job explaining it. The last question I had related to your letter to the Triangle Task Force, where you essentially say uh, that if nobody does anything, you're seriously considering um, putting up the fencing and building the state. My question is, when you say the state, do you mean Caltrans? And do you realistically think there's any chance we would get reimbursed if we did that? Yeah, in fact, in the new letter that I sent you, uh, it's not as threatening because I think Deborah is actually doing something, which is, the, like I said, the first time I've seen it. So, you know, like I said, I'm somewhat of the antagonist if you don't solve the problem. We're not going to we're gonna make this problem worse if people can just start driving in there and unloading vehicles and vans and trailers. You know, you can only imagine how that's gonna go, right? So we, when I saw that, we needed to solve that problem like right now. Um, you'll see in the new letter, I suggest K-Rails. That Caltrans has K-Rails all over the place that they could put in there. It's a simple solution to block the opening. Doesn't even have to be fencing repair. Um, I referenced that John Johnson was out there with uh, Caltrans maintenance. They seem to elude, well, it's a funding issue and there's a timing and you know how backed up they are. It's like, no, we got to fix this now, not a week from now, not 10 days from now, not a month and a half from now. You know, we need to resolve it now. So specific to your question, I referenced that when we did the freeway doors, uh, when we put the stickers and the signs and put the work into putting up 
our marking system, this is the, the sound walls that have our access doors every thousand feet. Another program that we piloted with the state of California to something they had never thought about is once you surround the freeway with, you know, 16 foot walls or 14 foot walls, how's the fire department supposed to put fires out when they can't access water supply anymore, right? So, you know, we put in the door system every thousand feet and we put in the marking. They paid us after the fact for the markings, the marking system, the placard. It can be done. Anything can be done if that's what they want to do. So I posed that directly to Deborah, which was, let us just do it if you don't think you can do it in a timely fashion. You know, we're not, we're not the bureaucracy that they are uh, when it comes to, you know, seconds, minutes, and hours. And that's, that's also the beauty that we deal with in the federal environment, right? The feds, FEMA, they're the, they're the weeks, months, and years. People. So, you know, during the, bringing, bringing that ability to rapidly solve this problem is going to improve the situation, not continue to let it deteriorate. So I'm hoping Deborah is going to either be able to push the right buttons over at Caltrans to get this done, or, you know, we come up with the plan B, C, or D. And if it's something that she says, yeah, if you do it in the immediate, we'll reimburse you. As far as I'm concerned, that's a, that's a worthy thing to get to get done. Because again, it's only going to get worse if, if vehicles are allowed to go in there and drop off building materials and who knows what else. Okay, thank you. You bet. Robert? Yes, Jim. Jim? You know, I, I have comments with regard to the, this fencing. I, I, I believe we did not, we have not put it in. Uh, I don't know where we draw the line here between using district resources to address this problem. You know, taking it to an extreme, uh, you know, we would be providing housing and meals and, and whatnot. And that's, that's well outside our lane. So uh, even putting up a fence on state property raises a whole lot of issues. If it's Caltrans property and the Caltrans responsibility, I think we need to be very cautious about uh, moving into the enforcement lane, the health and safety lane, the medical lane. You know, I, I know that we as first responders touch on a lot of those things, but when you go back to fundamental basic responsibilities and duties, if they aren't ours, I don't think we should be quick to take them on. I think we should shine a light on it. I think we should uh, bring people to the table. I think we should uh, uh, encourage demand that the people that have responsibility own that responsibility and do what needs to be done. But I think we need to be very careful if, uh, if we step into that role when it's not ours. That's all I have. Is there um, any other comments? Um, yeah, Robert. Rob? Yeah, yeah. Robert. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I just have two questions. And uh, if we all aren't aware that there's an assembly bill, 1845, that creates a special uh, division for homelessness under the governor's office. And that's been passed uh, September 4th, and it's been enrolled, which means it's waiting to be passed to the governor for his signature. So that's a good step forward relative to that. Uh, at least the state's taking a really good action uh, step forward for that. Also, who, uh, Chief, who chairs the committee on this, these meetings? It's the city of Menlo Park. So it's, uh, Cecilia Taylor is, is the lead along with uh, Ray Mueller, but Cecilia, basically the city schedules, uh, it's a monthly meeting. And then, you know, I don't know that they necessarily, you know, to Director McLaughlin's point, I don't know that they assess, necessarily assign work. I think all of us who are coming to the table try and address our specific issues and then fill the voids where if it's related to what they do, um, you know, so then, make that happen. Okay, so then, so then um, Medlow Park is pretty much taking the lead on this then? 
Yes. And then, so they're chairing the committee. Uh, are there any uh, notes taken or is there an actual name of the committee? So I call it the Triangle Task Force. Um, and I don't, I believe the city may take notes. I know they did that for one meeting, but uh, you know, I haven't seen uh, minutes since then. Um, I think they did that early on. It's yeah, called, that, Rob, it's, it's called yeah. the Ravenswood Triangle, Triangle Homeless Task Force. Yeah, because you know, I would be interested in, you know, uh, at least some type of, uh, if they meet once a week or once every two weeks or whatever, if we could get that information uh, and pass to the board, that'd be yeah, great. I agree, Rob. I agree. I mean, this is a big problem and our board should be kept up, um, kept abreast of this. Especially, you know, Virginia, that, that, you know, that the state felt it in such a need that they created a special section of the governor's office to handle these types of situations and coordinate it with the local uh, agencies. And I think, uh, you know, with that organization comes uh, basically a way where that they can be traced and maybe the state can help us out with this under this new uh, section of the governor's office. And that's, uh, Robert, that's uh, AB 1845 is the bill. So if you want to pass that on to Cecilia when you go, either you or Harold, it's supposed to be uh, what they call enrolled, which means that the authors need to sign it and then pass it to the governor for his signature. So it looks like it's on its way. Uh, 1845. Eight, yeah, Robert, 1845, AB 1845. Okay. I will. I'll pass that on to her. Okay, thank you. Any other comments for the chief? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, uh, then we'll, uh, at this point, uh, if I can uh, indulge the board before you move to your next item, number two, which would be Steve, if you can have the public comment section. Uh, uh, Lynn, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear okay. me? Yes. Okay, first, thank you very much for your courtesy tonight, and I apologize for my problem. No worries. No worries. <laughs> okay. I wanted uh, first to your talk about the homeless. I've been working part time with the census and I just wanted to let you know that next week they are planning outreach to the homeless, including a, one night, a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. count. So I don't know the details. They just asked if I would be willing to do that. And certainly I wouldn't want to volunteer to go out into the triangle area, but I'll, I'll keep I'll keep you informed if I feel there's anything they're planning that you should be aware of that, that I do know about and can share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. I wanted to make sure everyone knew about the new National CERT Association. And the leader of that, Stu Bata, he's also a leader with California Volunteers. I couldn't find his exact title before your meeting, but I believe that he leads California Volunteers Emergency Preparedness arm of the organization. So it's been rolled out and the purpose was, the intent was to strengthen the CERT program through the US and internationally. And so they're working with FEMA and their goal is to leverage the strength and experience of CERT programs nationwide to share guidance and best practices as well as build more robust communication channels. So the programs can connect with each other more efficiently. So th this has really been a huge hole that's been missing for some time, some kind of broad horizontal um, support, if you will, across the country and internationally. So that is coming and um, let me know if you, know, you want, you can just Google National CERT Association and get it. Um, I did briefly just want to tell you a few things about MPC Ready. Um, September is National Preparedness Month, as you know, we, we're preparing door hangers. So we're in, we have them prepared. The English and Spanish are being printed. This Saturday, I will be meeting with Mayor Cecilia Taylor and the block coordinators out near the 2924. We're gonna start out there and our goal is, and this is a way also to bring in more volunteers, 
distribute these to every household. So it's focused on uh, your emergency kit, and there's a little you know bit about what else people could do, but we're doing that. We want to reach more households with the message of preparedness, and we have about we'll have about um, you know we want to take it out to other areas too. You know, um, so we have a door hanger project. We're going to sh share that, and I guess that's the main thing I want to talk about. I just want to thank you. We, we're also um, working on improving our Get Ready offerings. We have two volunteers who are working on a consistent slide deck, uh, leveraging best practices with speaker notes and instructor guide, a little flyer. And our goal is down the road, more people can give the Get Ready training. That's where we want to focus, um, you know, a two hour, and then take it out to churches, schools, etc., where we can help those organizations better help their community to be ready, um, and so forth. So thank you for indulging me here and for all your um, good work. Thank you, Lynn. We appreciate it very much, all the work you're doing um, and still yet to do. Um, so, um, uh, is Steve, are you there? I am here, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We're moving on to item number two, council, general council report. Great, thank you, directors. Good evening. Um, welcome to episode two of the Fire District's General Counsel Report, the Brown Act edition. Uh, tonight's topic will be uh, an overview of the Brown Act's agenda requirements. And in particular, wanted to talk to you tonight about um, some guidelines and best practices and personal preferences regarding the tricky situation of sticking to agenda topics during meetings. And this can refer both to uh, item, discussions on items that are not at all agendized or more commonly discussions that just sort of stray from a topic that may be agendized. So the starting place as always is the law itself and the statute, the Brown Act requires that there be a brief general description of each item of business to be transacted or discussed at the meeting. Um, and that brief general description generally need not be more than 20 words, says the Brown Act. Um, even, so that's, that's the law. Um, even informational items require agendizing. In the, the, the Brown Act language I just mentioned, it's a, it applies both to any item of business to be either transacted or just discussed. Um, and this is for good reasons because discussion alone uh, even at one meeting could lead to uh, an action taken at the next meeting and the policy of the Brown Act is uh, in favor of encouraging and requiring transparency and encouraging public participation even on items that may not call for action so long as they are worthy of discussion by the board, they are worthy of providing notice to the public and uh, courts have found Brown Act violations even when no action was taken. So it's a misconception that so long as there's no action taken, you can talk about anything you want. The Brown Act requires uh, agenda items of 20 words, um, approximately or less, uh, for any item to be discussed or transacted. Uh, so um, there are difficult gray areas, as often with the Brown Act. The law seems very clear on the surface, and it's a short little piece of legislation, but the more you scratch at the surface, the more complexities arise. Um, and in particular, an issue that sometimes come up, or often comes up, are um, an issue like the one under which I'm speaking right now, which just says general counsel report on your agenda and doesn't say anything more than that. Uh, so the Attorney General has opined in the context of a city manager report, but that's pretty generally and universally accepted as applying these rules apply to any kind of report, whether it be a city manager report or a general counsel report or a fire, a fire chief report that you just heard, or your committee reports or your director reports that are coming at the end of this meeting where it just says general counsel report. The Attorney General has opined that it's okay for a city manager report not to provide additional detail that does not violate the Brown Act, so long as, number one, there's no action taken, 
And number two, there is no extended discussion. And I put hand quotes around extended discussion because there is no detail or real guidance about what it takes to be extended. And so you come into the area of sort of what's considered best practice, best practices by those of us who practice, all of us in the area of the Brown Act and uh, in, in terms of promoting the, the purposes of the Brown Act of transparency and inclusion of the public. Um, and I have two general thoughts to share with you as far as my approach to this issue. The first is where possible, it's good to put a little more meat on the bones. And I fully acknowledge that I probably could have done better in agendizing this particular item that I'm speaking on. And uh, next time I will give Michelle a little more information. So it would say general counsel report, colon, Brown Act agenda requirements. Um, th that would help a little bit. And, and that's on me, not on Michelle. I, um, I just didn't get to her in time, but I will next time. Another thing one can do when there are reports that are recurring and that, top, uh, that, that hit on topics that are recurring, you often see in things like city manager's reports, or in this case, the fire chief's report, uh, some bullet points of those items that might come up for, uh, again and again in meeting after meeting. So you could have bullet points of Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Town of Atherton, uh, wildfires. And, and I'll, I'll work maybe offline with President Jones and the fire chief and see if we can maybe add a little information for the public about what uh, the fire chief talks about. Um, now you do have in your packet a detailed report from the fire chief, but interestingly from the Brown Act's perspective, these agenda requirements are satisfied really only by the agenda itself. The Brown Act doesn't look mm. to the packet to satisfy Brown Act requirements. Um, but there are admittedly some uh, areas where it's impractical even to do that like your director reports at the end of this meeting or the reports of committees, uh, it would be infeasible and administratively difficult to, to load up your agenda with information about each item. And there, I think it just becomes incumbent on all of us, and this is really the message I will leave you with, to try to keep discussions on items that have not been agendized, to try and keep them from becoming extended. Um, I, I am not a Brown Act cop, and I don't like to see the Brown Act get weaponized to use as a way of, of limiting other people's uh, ability to speak. But I think we should always ask ourselves, that, is this a topic of interest to the public in our district? And that's such that they ought to know in advance that we're going to be spending a long time talking about this and discussing it, not just getting a report on it. And if the answer to that question is yes, then I think it's probably a good idea to take a step back and say, hey, let's agendize this for a, a more fulsome discussion at a later meeting. Um, but admittedly, that is a, a gray area, and um, I don't think that it's, you know, I'll make sure we don't all of us get into trouble, but it's worth always keeping at least in the back of our minds. Um, and that's the end of my uh, short discussion. Um, mindful of what I just talked about, but if uh, there are any questions, I think we can safely answer them and address them uh, without becoming an extended discussion on this of our own. Yes, yeah. Director Bernstein, if you unmute yourself, I'm happy to hear your question. So real quick question. <clears throat> Typically, we put out the materials or the agenda about five days in advance of the meeting. Um, can we do an updated agenda within the 72 hour time frame to cure any deficiency? Uh, so the Brown Act notice requirements are that it must be, you know, a regular meeting must be noticed 72 hours in advance. And if you put something out more than 72 hours in advance and then want to amend the agenda, um, I, I don't look at that as fixing a deficiency. As long as you're before 72 hours, um, you are, meeting all Brown Act requirements and you're welcome to augment, update, change, modify in any way you like the agenda. Thank you. You're welcome, it's a good question. Any comments for, for Steve? Questions? Thank you, Steve. Um, you're welcome, so I have so one, one more little, I've only done this twice, so I, I, I'm enjoying myself giving you these presentations and feel like mm -hmm. there's a value, but I welcome your feedback offline if you think this is a bad experiment. 
uh, or want to see it go in a different direction, maybe uh, send an email to me. Um, I, I, I don't want to force these little presentations uh, on you in an unwilling way. So I welcome your feedback. Well, personally, I think it, it, I think it's a good brief update. I know it's one of the things where somewhere in the bylaws that talked about our bylaws that talked about having uh, Brown Act um, uh, education. Uh, I think it's once a year or a period, maybe it's twice a year. Uh, so I think it's it's quite timely. I, since I've been on the board the last two two and a half years, we haven't we haven't had this. So it's a good update for myself and hopefully uh, other board members can glean something from it. Uh, and there, there will be different areas of, uh, I think that you have looked at to try to cover at least between now and the end of the year. And I think, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm benefiting from it for sure. And, and it's okay to be a cop too. I think you brought out cop. We uh, give you the permission to do that because we All do right. vary from the course sometime on this board. <laughs> so. Well. Thank you, but I'm leaving my badge at home. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Although I'm at home, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at home. So you left it at home. Uh, if you have no other questions, we'll move on to a uh, presentation uh, update from uh, Belinda. Uh, are you online? I um, am. Good, okay. good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. See, I can. I think everybody <laughs> else can too. Great. Um, I just have a brief, um, brief update and presentation. Um, let me share um, one slide with you. I, I think Michelle said, oops. I think I beat you, Belinda. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you going to show it? Oh, can you not see it now? Uh, okay. I had it. I think it got confused because we were both trying to share our screen at the same time. What about now? Perfect. It's really small, Michelle. Maybe um, you... That's as, as big as I, I can get it. I can take it off my screen, and if Belinda wants to share it on her screen, maybe it'll be different. Let's, let's try that. OK, hang on one second. You know, okay. in addition okay. to my general counsel services, I can also provide you with Zoom training. Each of us can <laughs> drag the, pres the screen to the left and the right and make it as big or as small as we like. <laughs> and I have to do that too, because I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not as skillful. Ha halfway down the screen, you should see a little double vertical line that's a little emphasized. And if you click and drag on that to the right or left, you make her screen bigger or smaller. Are you seeing it now? Oh, that's for Director Crawley, so. Yeah, I see it, it's large. Um, Mine yeah. seems large. I, I don't, that's okay. I, I mean, I still see the little, just the little screen, you, no big uh, deal. Director Crowley, where, where everybody's videos are, all your faces are, in the bottom right-hand corner, if you put your cursor there, there's two double arrows will show and you could maximize the screen. Okay. And we're just, we're oh, here. Okay, I got it. Okay, okay. thank you. You're welcome. And I'm sure we can make this available to everyone um, in a PDF afterwards as well. Um, so basically, I just wanted to give um, an update on uh, the work um, that we're doing, uh, integrating the board's priorities that um, you, all, you all set last March um, with the um, organization's strategic plan goals. So we have here on the top, these are the, the nine strategic plan goals. Um, for the um, five-year strategic plan. And then below here, we have um, the 10 priorities that the board set, which fall under the, um, the different uh, strategic plan goals. And so um, what we're doing with the, mostly through the strategic planning committee is working on an implementation plan um, that will be um, probably mostly staff driven, but with input, um, the strategic planning committee members have contributed to building out some um, strategies and actions related to the board priorities. And then um, I'm working with the strategic planning committee and Chief Navarro on staff and the staff team to integrate all of that, um, those ideas into an implementation plan um, that the staff will lead and that the board will get updates on, um, probably somewhat through via the committees. Um, 
The other thing we've been working on is a draft of an annual rhythm for um, the board and staff in terms of just milestones that you um, visit every at different points throughout the year. Um, the vision is not so much that every year you would re reinvent your goals and priorities, but maybe there would be just a, a, a tweaking or an adjustment of those goals or or, or priorities, but the, the idea is that the, the overarching goals would stay the same from year to year. Um, the other thing that we're working on is uh, looking at clarifying roles and decision-making processes um, and just bringing some clarity um, around um, decision-making and roles and um, processes. And a lot of that actually is, is um, clarifying policies and procedures that you already have um, in place. Um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell and happy to take questions and I know the strategic planning committee members um, have been involved with this every step of the way as well. Kim, is there something you want to add um, the, before we open it up for questions? That's, that's my summary. Nothing else. Okay. Robert. Yes. Thank you, Robert. Uh, this is a great job you've done, Belinda. Uh, you have not only integrated what uh, Chief Navarro is doing with the accreditation plan, but you've blended it quite well with an overlap of, of what us as a board need to support the organization. And, I, and you've done a really great job with this. Thank you. Jim, anybody else have any questions? Chuck? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> Excuse me, Belinda. Um, I'm a little concerned about the ordering of these A through J, which suggests some sort of priority. And I, I don't believe that from a voting standpoint, this represented the priority that we had. In fact, as I recall from last month, uh, your presentation then, it seemed to me that one of these goals was on there and it received zero votes from directors. In other words, it was not a priority. Um, and before when you showed this, you showed in parentheses how many votes each one got. It seems to me that we should be ordering these things. How shall I say, the, the, the top part of this is the strategic stuff, which is fine, but it's not what concerns the board. I think what concerns the board is the lower half of the, of the chart and that these should be in some sort of priority order as the board determined and not to co coincide with one through nine up above. Can you tell right. you know me which one had zero votes? Was it F? Um, I would, I'll have to pull that up. Um, but you're right. These are not in order of priority. They are in order of, um, of the board, of the organization's strategic goals. Um, and I believe, um, yeah, so I don't have that order handy right now, right in front of me, but um, but I can pull that up. Um, I, I think it seems to me, if I may add, Chuck, uh, just my comments. What I, what I from based on it, what I, I the information I've looked at, I, I think part of what uh, since there there was we have the. Um, uh, uh, th this uh, document, which is standards to cover document, that in and of itself outlines certain um, uh, goals that from that, so it's, it's sort of like it's an integration, trying to do an integration of, of both that particular document and the goals that, uh, that the board looked at over the last couple of years uh, and, and trying to put them in sync with what is already existing uh, that's going on right now uh, or vice versa so that so that we can see the relationship between what the board is actually have, have proposed as possible goal because if you look at that that chart that Belinda showed where it integrated uh, it showed the, the, the what she had up it showed where which committee uh, would, be, would, be, would have some function uh, uh, working on that particular, that particular goal. Um, and unfortunately, I, I, I don't have, it's not up now, I can better show you. So there, there is, 
there there was uh, as Belinda said, it's not a the A to J is just a um, in terms of the number, the sequencing of that particular uh, that particular goal. It it, it has no priority. Uh, 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 you know, it's not set in the priority, but these are uh, the top ones that the board uh, recognized. Um, and I don't know uh, if there, if Belinda, you got that, that chart. Yes. If we don't have yeah, it, yet, it's up always, right now. Always, I can't, um, my system don't went bad, so I'm gonna have to turn it over to somebody else. So I talk. Well, let me, let me respond though. The, <clears throat> the one that's the fourth from the right side, mm -hmm. strength and employee relations had zero votes. In other words, this is not a priority of the board, and I, I think it's a misstatement. We don't have to have 10. I think it's all right if we only have nine, but to have something that nobody was supporting doesn't seem to me to be a priority of the board, and I think it, it's, it's mistaken. And I, I think, let me say, mm -hmm. even I, I like the idea, as Robert was talking about, of integrating the strategic goals with our goals, and that's fine, but the strategic goals weren't ordered in priority either. They were simply numbered but it's not like number one was the most important and number two was the second most important. But our goals, I think if you look at these, um, for example, the second one from the left, perform data analysis and improve response time, that got 10 people, or 10 votes for wanting that. And yet it's all the way over on the right side. It's like number G or something in, in what it just presented, which would suggest that it wasn't very important. And I, I think we need to order these in terms of, of priority just to keep, you know, so if you look at number two up on the line there, the second one and the third one, those were the top two and it goes down from there. Anyway, I, I'd, I'd like to see us, if nobody wants to strengthen employee relations, then that shouldn't be stated as a board, as a board goal. We can, we can certainly redesign it to uh, emphasize the order of priority. Um, I, I agree with you that the, the zero votes on the strength and employee relations stands out um, and you could drop that one. At the same time, I don't know that um, I would say that nobody thought it was a priority. It did have two comments um, in, when we did our brainstorming session that fell under that category. So it was an area of interest, but when people had only six votes, that was, you're right, that no, nobody had that as one of their, um, their six top priorities. Okay, well, that's, I would like to see these expressed in priority order. Um, just, it, it helps us keep our work plan straight, what, what we wanna mm -hmm. address first and what's less important. So how, the, the, it opens up a question, Chuck, uh, it, you would like to see that, or are you saying that in terms of process wise, or are you, uh, is that a board uh, kind of looking at it and say, hey, we, and, and hassling over which one is, should be one, two, and three? I mean, what method of, of identification of whether, which one of these fall on it? Is it basic numerical ranking? Uh, is, is it just based on a wish list or somebody individually taking a, taking a shot at, at, at trying to pull it together? Well, I don't know if you can see the chart now. But yeah, I see it now. Yeah. Oh, okay. But it's, it certainly seems to me that the ones people put the most votes on would be the ones that were the highest priority. I, I don't know what other conclusion mm -hmm. we can have. I'm not speaking right. my own priority. It's just obvious from the chart. And unfortunately, the new chart loses the value mm -hmm. of this old one. And I don't want to lose the value of the old one because it tells us what's the most important to the board members right now. Robert? Yes, uh, who is it? Jim. Oh, Jim, okay. You know, I, I was involved in this process. So I, I'd just like to share some, some thoughts. Uh, when we discussed the, uh, the strategic goals, the thought was that those, those should remain pretty well fixed for the planning period, for that five-year planning period, but that every year the board can, can emphasize various areas. And the areas that are emphasized have to align to one of those strategic goals. Uh, I, I agree with you, Chuck. I, I think the one that we, uh, uh, you know, examining uh, uh, data to improve response time. I believe that was far and away our number one pick, and I think that needs to be 
reflected, but I think we wanted to stay away, or, and I'm referring to the discussions that, that Robert and Belinda and I had uh, a week or two ago, that, that there should only be one set of strategic planning goals. And uh, alongside that then in, in a given year, there'd be a handful of areas that the, that the board feels need to be emphasized. Like in this, when the, the SOC report that came up and showed response times that, uh, that were uh, below uh, established standards, uh, you know, for this year, we will examine that and, uh, and look for some improvements, but that, that fit within one of those strategic planning goals. So again, my thoughts. Thank you, Jim. Any other comments? I think what is um, so if, if the it depending on if the board taking is looking at um, want to take all of what Blenda have up on the screen right now, um, I, I think she's kind of they are kind of put in certain categories at this point in time, uh, and so our our next step and correct me if I'm wrong, Belinda, is to begin to look at, uh, we have started to look at, you know, these are actions, these are items and actions that the board uh, will, will undertake uh, and which committee uh, should under, begin to, to, to get assigned those particular uh, activities. So that's, that's what Belinda, the first shot she put up there, it, if the board want to try to take all of what's, what you see before you right now and integrate that into the first chart that Belinda put up, then, then that's a different kind of work. That's that we have to kind of focus on that so that all of those, those areas that, that was put up, the last chart you saw will be integrated into that first chart um, if that's where the board wants to take this. Um, because that, that, that's the only way we're gonna be able to kind of put this to rest, to move on to actually doing as a board, begin to look at each one of those areas and Belinda outlined those in that first chart she put up, assign it to different committee, whether it's EPREP, finance, human resource, or strategic planning uh, committee, or maybe there might be a special committee uh, that's generated in order to focus in on that, those areas. Does that make sense? Now I take it that everybody agree with it. There's no comment. So in terms of uh, moving forward, uh, our next step would be uh, if, if, the, the, if the board is so choosing, uh, is agreeing to it, that we will uh, take, take that last chart that Belinda had up with everything and, and integrated into this particular chart that we have here, because all it's saying is this is the committee, these are the committees that we we'll work on. If you see the little symbols in the bottom, what's up at the top, show you exactly what committee is going to work on what, which board committee is going to work on what, what activity uh, in that category. Because um, the, the end result from that, from this point, will be again to try to uh, look at uh, 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 how report, how we're going to, how often the reports come, will come back to the board. Uh, hopefully activities, be, uh, reports be coming back monthly. And, and how overall that the board, how often the board throughout the year really needs to step back and look at what, where it's at and, and what is being accomplished. Kind of monitor ourselves, track, track our progress, uh, because the end result is, as Jim mentioned earlier, at the end of the year, if we were to sit down in, in January, uh, December, and say, hey, what are we going to do for next year? You know, wh where, are, where are we stall? Is there new priorities? You know, do we have to reshift and refocus uh, because of a different activity? We as the board can be able to be in a better position, not only to totally abandon where we are or what we have been working on, but yet still be able to kind of be flexible enough work and, and shift with where, where we where we need to go and what's up at that point in time. Rob, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, 
the good thing about this, as you just mentioned, that December comes around, it can be changed, but there is that baseline or stabilization relative to what Chief Navarro did involving the accreditation process and the strategic plan that that is within his accreditation process. So we're just as a supporting role relative to what the overall fire district strategic plan would be. So I agree with you that way, Robert. Thank you, Rob. Any other comment? Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, Robert, I'm not sure exactly what you meant, but I think you're saying okay. you would put the numbers that we saw on the previous chart into this chart, the little numbers that were in parentheses. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying if that's what the board wants to do, uh, it, it seemed like that's what I was at least hearing from you. And I think uh, uh, Rob was kind of echoing that a little bit. Uh, so I'm saying if that's what the board wants to see, wants to see all of it into this particular chart that's before you, then I think the strategic planning committee would have to go back with Belinda and put it in there somewhere. Uh, you know, uh, because this, this will be the committee's homework. This will be the committee's task. Whether you on that committee this next year, is a whole, it's a different question. The committee work will continue at that point. So yeah, I'm saying we can do that if that's what the board wants to do. Am I right, Belinda? Is that part of what how you see it as well? Yes, I think that we can we can incorporate some of the nuances from the previous um, uh, more detailed slide, including the number of votes. Um, we can maybe you know remove the ABC the the alphabetized list so that it doesn't appear to be prioritized. We can redesign this in a couple of ways and try a couple of options, um, including one that has the board goals on the top um, and bring that back. Um, However, if I may interject real quick, that if you see, for example, take an emergency prep, right, what's on the screen, right there, there's, there's two items. There may be five other items. The emergency prep can work on all of them. So within that, within that emergency prep, you got 10 different areas, items in there. Somehow that has to be prioritized, I would think, in order to what, what needs to be worked on at this juncture and then, then looking at the calendar of when you're going to be able to complete it so the board can finalize it and then moving on to the next task. Um, so so in, in all, these, all those other areas, once we bring them in, we'll start to fill up the, the screen. And so it's going to be up to, I think, the board and the committee uh, to prioritize each one of them because there may be a certain emphasis that needs to take place uh, as a board. Uh, not necessarily the individual, but as a board, uh, as it relates to, again, the, the overall strategic goal, uh, what is trying to be accomplished in that, in that segment. Well, for this year, at least the board has spoken on that. And I, I would, then would recommend we take off F here because again, nobody spoke for as a- as I think a, let's get them all in there first and then we'll, we'll why, why I, I would think. One that nobody wanted. I, I just, I don't know. I don't think nobody wanted. I wanted, I, I just got well, to voted for it. Well, then. I ran out, I ran out of stickers. If I had 12 well, stickers, I would put it on there. But what but, I'm saying is that just because no one voted on it, are, are you saying employ, improving employees relations is not important? I would say I could have mentioned is five not important. Things. I could have mentioned not important. things that got zero votes. Is there they not important to you? So is that I, not important? I would say it's not as important as the other things we are talking is it about. But is it important at all to have a conversation on it? Uh, no. Whether this year or 10 years from now, is it important? I think it is at some point. It may but, not take a high priority this today, but it may be important. So I think it was somebody brought it up and it got on the list. So why? Why disrespect? I think the I brought, brought it up, up. Robert. Why I think the I person and just just put it on there. We'll put, it may be the last one on somebody's list, but at least it's up there, not out of sight. But I think I brought, brought it up, Robert. I think I put it up there. Okay. There Maybe. were two two I mean, comments, two people that brought it up. Would have been on this list. It, it, it's a silly list then if it's got zero. So it so it 
it got zero when you narrowed it down. But when we did the brainstorm, there were two people who put that as a priority, as an initial priority. But then when we narrowed it down and everyone only got six votes, it's correct that nobody chose it as a top six. So let's, let's not get hung up on, um, it, we got, it's there and like everything else, let's just put it somewhere and then the committee decide whether it's important or not to work on at this point in junction. Next year, it may take on a whole different emphasis. It may become a top priority based on the changes and the moves that goes on in, a, in our industry, in our, at our company, um, and, and in society in general. So I, I, I wouldn't make value judgment on it right now. Uh, it, it, and I think the board needs to follow a process and that process to take everything that has been mentioned that has been listed that, 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 that last chart and put it somewhere and have the committee to prioritize its value from one to 10 or whatever the number is in that category. And that way we don't disrespect anybody Well, who put it up there. Because you, you, you may put something up there that somebody don't want. Then I think it should come off. I mean, I, 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 I think nobody wants it. Why should it be up there? I, I just, I, well, I think it's no, silly. It's well, nobody is not necessarily one person. I mean, just just got one person don't want up there doesn't mean it, 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 the other folks may not want up there. But anyway, let's not split hairs on that. I, I hear what you're saying, Chuck. I'm not trying to be argumentative. You know what I'm saying I'm trying to look at a process where we can we yeah, can we can solve you, the problem. You have a process where because you say it, it's there, and because no, I didn't say it was. I didn't say it needs to stay there. I'm just saying it's there. I'll, the I'll board right. the board said it was not worth looking at. No, That's you no you matter. said it. Two people said it was good. It no, just when it got down to the last six, you only got six stickers, it didn't make yeah. the cut. That's all. That's all. So let's not argue. I don't want to argue with you. I want to move forward on it. No, you, Finish you up your comment. You want to impose your will on it, and I just think it's not a good process. So I, I'm sorry. I just I can't see having something on there that I, that's, that people didn't want. I don't understand why. So, when you say so people, director, director Bernstein, I, I just want to make sure that I was clear um, enough in it, just explaining the process. Um, I understood the I process just, entirely. I understood. It's just one of those things that's, that's, I understand the process. You don't need to repeat it to me. Okay, yeah. I mean, I think the only I, thing I, I would like, like to hear the, the process. process. I just, would like the to hear the The one thing I just want to make sure everyone understands is that, so it started off with everyone listing all of their ideas and priorities. And in that round, the um, strength and employee relations had two different comments, either by the same person or by two different people. I don't know. Um, bringing that up as a, as a concern and area that, for the board to prioritize. When it came down to narrowing that initial list, it no long, it did not make it um, on that, that shorter list. So it's correct, it not, did not make it on the short list, but it certainly was a, a, an area of concern and interest. Jim, you got any comments? Rob? No, I, I, I'm fine with moving forward with, with integrating the two and, you know, leaving the, the list of priorities as is. And I think it's, uh, it, it'll be up to the board to uh, decide, do we do the top three, the top five, or the top 10? Right. When do, when do we decide that? Well, I said that's, yeah, I, we're in the process. I, I think, you know, after we go through this process, uh, then we would we'll have to gauge, you know, how how many of these priority items do we want to emphasize uh, for this calendar year? Right. We only got a couple maybe months left. Three of them, maybe all ten. <laughs> right. I think the other thing too is that that is a priority in your overall five-year strategic plan. You've got um, the the support, mentorship of future leaders, and personnel development, but it doesn't need to be something that the board focuses on necessarily, nevertheless. So it's our goal is to finish getting input from the board tonight at, at our next strategic planning committee meeting, take this information from you, sit down, look at it. Hopefully our goal is in, in um, October board meeting, we will bring back what we have 
we have put together it, along with a, a beginning scheduling of how, how we would start integrating uh, um, uh, these activities in this process, this work. Yes, um, with, the, with the staff um, process um, in the lead in terms of implementation. Exactly, exactly. Rob? Yes, uh, you know, what Melinda just said, with the, with the staff implementation of it, and that's such an important element here, where that, you know, with the staff's strategic plan involving the accreditation process, it's so important to have baseline, which is what we have. And as a board, we have supported those baseline identified areas of the accreditation package to bring it forward. So uh, both are breathing living documents. And I think by, by us following the accreditation part of the strategic plan, for 2020-2025 shows the organization in its quest for goals and objectives. So I, I think, we're, Robert, I think we're on the right path here. And it's just a little bit of wordsmithing. And as I said before, Belinda, to put this all together, you did a really great job. And thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, because the last, the last piece we will be putting together is a way in which to track and monitor uh, all of this. Because uh, I, I think that's what is the one, one I, I heard one of the biggest concerns was how do we monitor this as a board? How do we know that, that what we say and, 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 and talked about uh, is being implemented uh, so we, we're trying to think about the building in the, the process of, of being able to, to monitor this as a board from the policy and procedure perspective. Uh, and so I'm, I'm pretty excited about, you know, getting to that point. Uh, and I, I'm hoping that you are too, so that you can, you can, as a board member, you can see that what we talk about and is not just it is not just going uh, out in the wilderness somewhere, but it's being monitored by staff, it's being tracked by staff, it's being implemented by staff, uh, and where there's input and value that the board oversees all that, I, I think that's where, where to help staff get there is, is, a big, is a big deal. So are there any other comments uh, if, on this subject matter, uh, Chief, you, you there? You got anything you want to say? Uh, good, Director. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thumbs up. Uh, okay. All right. Let's move on to the other items. Uh, if we, uh, thank you, Belinda. Uh, is there anything final words you want to say before we move on? No, thank you for all the input. We'll look forward to the next round. Next round. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, next item on the agenda is um, oh, approval of minutes. Consent calendar. Consent, consent calendar. Uh, there's two items uh, the minutes of August 18th of this year and accepted treasury reports in the uh, month in July 31st. On so moved. To approve. Uh, a motion to move by Rob's proved second. I'll second it. Second by Virginia. Uh, any questions? Call for discussion. If none, I will call for a roll call vote. Director Bernstein? Aye. Director Crowley? Aye. Director Solano? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. Director Jones? Aye. It's been uh, passed unanimously. We'll move on to regular. Uh, item number six, regular agenda uh, item, which is discuss uh, a contract renewal with Slack Chief. Yeah, Director. So you have uh, in front of you uh, essentially the report that I presented to the Finance Committee. And in going through with them, you might recall that we uh, agreed to an extension of six months with Slack uh, because of the COVID issues. And one of the other things that uh, that I think uh, is important to remember about this is that they, like Facebook and other large campuses, are operating at a percentage 
of staff compared to what they were before. That's reflected in the uh, second attachment, which has to do with call volume. I think it was somewhere around 25 uh, calls for the year for this year, which is down by well over half of what we typically would see, if not more than that. Uh, and there's a historical perspective that we give you within that attachment with the number of calls. That said, um, specific again to the agreement, if you go to attachment D or exhibit D, it talks about what we did before when it comes to how this was charged. And what I proposed was something very similar, which was that there was no increase for the first two years. Now remember, we're six months into the next part of this agreement. So two years would be minus the six month extension. And then uh, foreseeably within to the next year, that would be the same thing. And the only reason I say that is because I can tell you like Facebook and others, they don't propose to open up. And when they propose to open up, they don't propose to open up with full staffing. Um, you know, typically what I'm hearing from most entities is that uh, some will start to open up maybe next year by June. And if so, they'll open up with 25% population moving up to 50 at some point. So Slack is clearly, I think in that same, uh, in that same approach um, of how they would approach the, the contract as well and the staffing. And then equally in the agreement, what I put was an increase based upon uh, the percentage of calls over what the norm would be. And that shows you there what that would be on the second page of the staff report. That's in line with what we did before. And then uh, equally it also addresses as we've done before. So again, similarly, um, a tr an increased charge if we add a ladder truck uh, and or a battalion chief up there. And what would that be when we remodel the station uh, similar to the brush unit that's up there or the wildland unit that's across staff, that would be a benefit for them because obviously it would be closer than coming from fire station one or elsewhere. And so uh, in the past, they've agreed to do that as well. Now, we haven't fully sat down and discussed this. So I'm just giving you basically the preliminary heads up that we're not done negotiating, but this is kind of how I'm approaching it and happy to hear any comments or suggestions going forward. So Chief, uh, before we open up a comment, uh, two things. One, um, you would like to get feedback from the board at this point in time. Uh, could we also, in the process, board member, if you had a chance to take a look at the agreement, uh, to comment on the agreement so that once we come back again, Chief, that we would have uh, either this item, those items already resolved, uh, integrated into the contract if it makes sense, so that we can um, uh, go from there, either put it on a consent calendar or have it on a regular agenda item to, to discuss. Hey, Robert, I think Lynn has her hand up for a public comment if you wanna take that. I just wanted you to note it. To, to uh, well, the public comment number three doesn't, oh yeah. No, right. on this right. item. Right, yes, I, I got, I forgot. We, we got a new protocol here. Uh, uh, should we, uh, okay, open it up for public comment. Uh, public comment, yes. Lynn, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. I'll be very brief. That's I okay. Just wanted to we'll say that, a couple hours. No, it's fine. I don't want to. Um, not the current staff report, but the chief staff report to the finance committee had public education, et cetera. Uh, uh, Lynn, excuse, excuse me, Lynn, I think um, I'm, maybe I, I, I'm, that was in cons, uh, consent calendar um, oh, okay. well, uh, regarding the, the uh, treasury report, if you make oh, a reference to that. I'm sorry, I'm not being very clear. I just want to say that what the far uh, district is doing with Slack. Some of the public, some of the training items are ones that I think the broader public would have an interest in. So, you know, some of these could be leverageable. That's all. Whatever you're doing with Slack, based on what I've re read in these reports, there's some really good ideas that, um, you know, gee, you know, I think volunteers would be happy to help with. So that's all. I'm just commenting on mm -hmm. that. Okay. 
All right, thanks. Uh, any other public comment, Michelle? I don't see any, no. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Um, so, um, yes, uh, back to item number six, board um, comments? Discussion? Chuck? I had a couple questions, just to make sure I'm understanding what you're putting out there, Chief. Um, if I look at page two of the staff report, do I understand correctly that right now we're getting $441,000 for this and the base level would be 449820 Or is this calculation related to buying the pumper and all that? Yeah, that's correct. So it's currently it's if we if we um, increase by 2% by adding the resources that I mentioned, it would take because that's under the suppression section. It would take it up to 449,820 if they agree. Okay, so so right now though, let me make make sure I'm understanding. R right now, are we getting today 441,000? That's correct. And you're proposing no change at all for two years. That's correct. Yeah, because the call volume is down so significantly, it was always built upon a base call volume of 100 calls. And as you can see, and I don't have that attachment easily in front of me. I know it's in the staff report, but we're down at, we're down in the twenties and but we it, don't, it, and we don't see that changing. The old contracts were down at 50 calls, not a hundred. Yeah, no, it was, but the baseline was always a hundred per year. A hundred per year was what was the negotiated number. So is it your feeling now that we're getting overpaid for the services we're providing today? Well, I don't know about overpaid. I mean, I think, you know, it's like anything else, right? There's the static cost, and that's how I look at it, whether, you know, whether we provide it or not, they, they exist. They still have calls that come in. There's still some work being done up there, you know, some of it's construction, which is a good thing because they're modernizing the campus or taking the opportunity to do that. But, uh, you know, that's why it's for the first two years, and like I said, we're six months into one of them, it's more of a status quo agreement just because the world is currently, you know, changed with all of the COVID related issues and people bringing back staffing onto their campuses. So it, it seems to me then if this, if it remains under a hundred calls, we'll go for the next five years with no increase in price on this contract. That's, there's a chance if they keep the call volume down I think one of the big things within what they liked about the last agreement was rather than try and figure out, you know, what the burden was, it's really about service delivery, right? So at the end of the day, if all of a sudden we start to see spikes in call volume, even if they're fal false alarms or other things, that's what makes their costs go up. So in any given year, you know, you look back at the previous year, and by the way, we meet month or uh, quarterly. So we're constantly working with them on you know different issues because it's a performance agreement to some degree and obviously there's a relationship we're trying to maintain to lynn's point you know we're, we're equally helping them with preparedness issues for their on-site capability as well because they have a robust on-site capability that in advance of our arrival hopefully is actually doing something between their security forces and their first you know the first responder teams that are in their that are in their um, prevention division. So, you know, we we stay on this quarterly. Well, um, let me let me come back to the question. I, I'm trying yeah. to get a sense of the cost here. I mean, the, the I understand what you're saying about call volume and all that. From our perspective, our costs are increasing. I don't know what three to five percent a year for staff and all that. Right. So over five years, our costs are going to go up. You know three to 5% compounded annually, which is, could be as much as 20, 25, 30%. Um, and and I'm, that, if we're charging the right amount now, it doesn't make sense. If we're in a sense over, if we're getting reimbursed more than it's really costing us, well, if it takes this long to catch up, then this is a catch up thing. So that might make more sense. And I, I guess I don't want to put you in the spot of saying, oh, we're overcharging them. But if we're charging the right amount right now, 
getting no increase for five years troubles me. If in fact they're way underutilizing what we're what we are giving them, then maybe it's reasonable. And I, that's what I, I'm just trying to understand the mechanics of it. And I, I just have one last point though. Let me make sure. I, I don't know the cost of these things, but a patrol pumper, we're talking about a three quarter of a million dollar vehicle, right? Uh, that year it's about, yeah, about two, it's about 250,000. 250,000, okay. But if we get $8,000 more, 9,000 more a year, that's $45,000. We're getting $45,000 to buy a $250,000 piece of equipment that's clearly made just for wildland fires. That doesn't seem like a very, I mean, that won't, that's not going to serve my neighborhood <laughs> and, and, and most of the neighborhoods in Menlo Park or Atherton or East Palo Alto. And so that part of it doesn't quite make sense to me. It seems to me if we need a wildland fire vehicle to serve them, they ought to be paying the lion's share of those costs. So they had both an engine and a rescue or, or wildland unit um, that you know, this whole agreement before, as you know, was 40 years with Palo Alto. Uh, we did not want to duplicate the re to own the resources that they had for obvious, you know, reasons of which uh, we didn't have the maintenance of that and so forth. But equally, in one way, if you look at it from the perspective of we've never had to use the wildland unit up there, but we have had to use it for different things that, that are specific to the fire district. I mean, in the end, we didn't buy it or purchase it because it benefited only Slack. Basically, we put it up there because it benefited the entire district, most specifically having that up on the western side of the fire district made a lot of sense given the topography, Woodside right above us, Portola Valley, and you know the ability for us to put an extra unit up there um, during different uh, red flag warnings or holidays like the 4th of July where there's an additional risk. So that's a, that's a plus one unstaffed cross staff unit that's uh, in the right location for us operationally and strategically. And Slack really wouldn't even need to contribute anything to it, but uh, they were willing to do that. So I don't understand what's gonna trigger then this extra 2% if you've already got the unit and it's already staffed, what new is gonna happen? So what happens is obviously in the, in the standards of cover report, it recommended that the ladder truck and the battalion chief move up there to that station if it's rebuilt and big enough to house all those companies. So there's a, there's a, a benefit to Slack. So trying to stay in line with what they already agreed with, which was the 1% increase if we put uh, a brush unit up there, it's, it stays within that same kind of context to make sure that that's something that they equally would want to support because it does benefit them, but it benefits quite honestly, everybody on the Western side of the fire district and helps us meet our standards of cover uh, recommendations. So do we have to put both a ladder truck and a pumper up there or just one or the other? Or I, I don't understand what triggers this additional amount of money. Yeah, so it'll be a battalion chief, which is recommended, and it's also a ladder truck. Oh, not a pump necessarily. That's, yeah, well, there, there needs to be an engine up there. That's our biggest area. So, yeah, I would never remember. We had another SOC from CityGate that said that that station was absolutely in the right spot, which is why we've moved forward with trying to get it to be replaced. So, it, you know, at the end of the day, two different studies, both SOCs, standards of covers, have recommended independently one don't move the station it's in the right spot so that engine is a critical resource up there and it's it's you know it's located in a strategic location and move forward with rebuilding the facility which is over 70 years old or oldest and the second one the most recent one that was done recommended putting both the ladder truck and a battalion chief in addition to a pumper up there so that we have good spread and response times from quote unquote harder to serve areas by having them both on the eastern side of the fire district at station two or 77 and equally at station four versus station one which is not as it, the response times are not as good to those areas up there just because of um, the location i have just one last question thank you um 
there's a bunch of restrictions that are in the pay, in the uh, documents that the government imposes on Slack and so forth. Yes. Do, do any of these things that relate to labor or human relations or our purchasing processes, is there anything that we have to do special or that limits us somehow by, by having this contract? Well, I'll let Stephen address that, but I'll tell you what, you know, if obviously this is an issue if we're a, no different than probably our federal and state partnerships too, but you know, working with the federal and state government, there are things that we try to comply with or need to comply with. Um, they need to update that portion of this. Uh, if you if you don't know that, I, I thought I mentioned that the last time we discussed this, but that still needs to be done. Uh, I know that's one of the reasons I had Stephen on the original call uh, with Slack, not only to introduce him to the to the process and to the players, but because as we all know, you know, the federal government's always adding things or changing things. So we have not seen the most recent iteration of that. I'm sure that will be forthcoming. And to kind of Director Jones's question or point about putting this on consent, I don't, I don't see that only from the standpoint of there's more to discuss, or there's more to do, and I don't know what I don't know, but I know one thing. Um, you know, you probably want to have more dialogue or be able to ask questions like that if, in fact, there's major changes to things that they add within an agreement. And I don't know what those would be, but, you know, like I said, this is just teeing it up to start to move it forward. They may disagree or they may have other things that they, you know, want or agree to or what have you. I mean, we're, you know, we're just starting to get into that part of the process, but I wanted to make sure you got to see it. So you knew what where I was going with it. Thank you, Robert. Yes, Jim. You know, uh, to Chuck's point regarding the uh, uh, the contract, you know, being fixed for uh, for five years, uh, it, it seems to me that that our resources are are the cost of our resources to respond to Slack are static or fixed, uh, regardless of the call volume whether it's 50 calls, 100 calls, or 150 calls. Uh, and, and that's really what Slack is. Slack is paying for a, a response capacity uh, rather than a, uh, you know, a, a contract based on some fixed number of calls. Otherwise, wouldn't we be billing them on a, uh, on a per run basis, which we don't because we have, we have to staff it, we have to equip it, house it, uh, in such a way that we can meet whatever the call volume is or whatever the nature of the call is. So uh, I would have, uh, I, I would like to see some kind of escalator over a five year uh, period. I think Chuck is right. You know, our costs are going to escalate uh, and I, I believe the contract should reflect that as well. Uh, Jim, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What, um, if that was so, what would be a a trigger do you think um uh to for 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 us to say hey uh it, it, would it be based on call volume increase and is there a a stepping stone to that that call volume with a stepping stone of increase from one percent to one and a half or two or something in that, in that order um to to address the issue of what if we don't know. I mean, right now when the COVID is down, who knows what after this thing get open, where how, how people may, you know, what may happen at that point. Right. And, and I see that they're, you know, looking at the staff report, I see that there's a you know, cost increase scale, you know, for years three to five. Uh, and, and that's contingent upon call volume. But again, our, our costs are, are fixed. Uh, and independent of right. of costume. so I, I think uh, I think the contract should reflect our fixed costs, and and we know our costs will be escalating over over the next five years. I just think the contract should reflect that. Are are you thinking in terms of inflationary costs? Uh, you know, t whatever whatever that is, yeah. or, or or maintenance I mean, costs, or. Yeah, I mean, primarily, you know, our personnel costs, that's our, that's our, our biggest single cost. You know, we know what, uh, what the contract increases are 
under the current contracts, and I don't want to presume any future contracts, but uh, you know, we we know you know that our costs, our maintenance costs, uh, and operating costs will be increasing by some measure. Do we? It, do you think we can draw a correlation between the increase in those costs, personnel costs, just for example, since that's more static and that's more ongoing? Can we draw a correlation between the percentage? increase on, on that and how it may equate to a, a increase, um, yeah, you know, equivalency to the increase that we may see on a year-to-year -year basis. Well, you know, I, I'd want to hear from the chief on that, but uh, again, on just this idea of, of fixed costs being independent of call volume, you know, Harold, what is, am I looking at that correctly or am I missing something? Oh, I think you're looking at it correctly. And, and, you know, to go back in the way back machine. So, you know, many, many years ago, 2012. Remember, this was a, I wouldn't say it was a difficult discussion. It was, it was, and as I reference in here, you know, it was only on the influence of LAFCO that Slack would pay anything. Um, USGS doesn't pay anything. It's a federal facility. VA hospital doesn't pay anything. So we tried to avoid COLA because of the escalator in that. Not to say that that's not a way to do it because you got to point to something, which I think is, you know, the topic of the conversation. But what do you point to? And, and maybe it is time for that. I know at the time when we did the calcs and we looked at the service, and of course, this is going in not knowing anything, but understanding that they could actually turn around and just go, we got a Menlo Park address and we don't need to pay you anything. It's, it's in your district. So, you know, we even have the two hour escalator. If you read the agreement, we're, if we're on a call or anybody's on a call, Woodside, Palo Alto, Redwood, whoever comes in for longer than two hours, they will pay no different than a state deployment, the hourly bill rate off the fed, off the state schedule. So, there are some, you know, some interesting provisions in there to protect us and others. But I mean, I can go in there and try a different strategy. It, it, I don't know that that will be something they'll, you know, be open to. But, you know, I don't, I think what you're asking isn't unreasonable, believe me. It's just a matter of, you know, I, I've, I'm always leery of the, well, we don't need to, we don't need to give you anything. Because quite honestly, that's the trump card they could throw. And, and Chief, could you maybe elaborate on that? Why would that be so? Is it because they have opportunities to go somewhere else? Well, it's the energy? Department of Energy. It's a federal entity. Federal government doesn't pay tax. They, that, they don't pay it at the VA hospital. They don't pay it at USGS. They don't pay property tax. The federal government doesn't pay that. And the property owner, uh, which is Stanford University, is a legacy owner. So it's, it's only categorized under raw land. And so you're looking at something that was, uh, you know, it's, it's basically paying off of a 1800s scale for its property tax, which is, you know, when we looked at this before going, it, it's nothing. So, you know, I mean, and, and it wasn't like we were trying to get something from nothing. It was trying to figure out a way, a path that everybody agreed to understanding that at, the mo at that time, it was difficult because, you know, we didn't want to see any negative impacts to the city of Palo Alto Fire Department. So literally, there, had, there was no personnel impacts. Nobody was let go or, you know, you know they didn't, they, the only thing that happened there was through attrition, they got down to a number to where they could absorb it. Were they happy about that? No. Mm. But I think they recognize the fact that the Menlo Park, it's in the Menlo Park Fire District. And when the Tiger team from the federal government made the decision that they no longer needed on-site protection, that's the trigger that opened up, you know, where's the address? And the address is Sand Hill Road, Menlo Park. Okay. Thanks. I can look, I, I hear what you're saying. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to make it easy. Um, I don't mean it's the wrong word. I'm not trying to just go along because what we did before. I thought about that too. But, you know, I, I, I also am concerned about uh, the, the comments that were made about, and, and Director Bernstein, I thought you, you, know, you raised a good point. 
I mean, at what point when the call volume is so low, they just say, well, we don't, why are we paying? You're, you're never here. And we don't, we're not getting all these other enhanced things because there's no one on campus that needs training or we're not doing drills or we're not doing a variety of things. So, you know, that's, that's a possibility too. So I, I just, I'm trying to finesse it. So the district sees some benefit clearly, but equally, you know, it doesn't feel onerous to the federal government because I don't know when I deal with the bean counters, who's going to count what beans. Is, is SLAC entirely within Menlo Park or is it part of it in Santa Clara County? Well, again, another really good question. It, it, the campus primarily is in Menlo Park for the main part of the campus, but the accelerator itself, the LINAC or Beam Alley, extends up into uh, Woodside uh, or Portola Valley. I can't remember which one, but I think it's Woodside. And uh, certainly Woodside Fire Protection District uh, could beat us on that end. There is a gate and we've made provisions for that. But, you know, it also borders, interesting left, you, you brought up Santa Clara County. It's, there is a bordering entity with the county and also with uh, the city of Palo Alto's area that they're responsible for. So not on the campus though, but adjacent to. So it's, it's, but it's, you know, again, you gotta go off what's the primary address side and uh, that's the main campus. Okay. Uh uh, any other questions for, for the chief? <clears throat> so, um, somebody say something? So, chief, are, <clears throat> do you have enough information? Uh, yeah, I think I do. And I think, you know, I think I'll have, a, again, a robust discussion with them. We'll see where they're coming from. Um, you know, again, I think we have a very good, you know, relationship with them. And, uh, you know, I appreciated that they were, you know, willing to do the extension. I understand their circumstances. Like I said, no different than that SRI International, USGS, Facebook, you know, their Slack is in the same boat with some of our larger, you know, campuses where they're literally completely operating in a, in a different way or certainly at a, at a different capacity than they were in the past, so. So you're in a filling mode with uh, Slack still, I, my assumption is, and is there, I assume based upon the, the, the question, the comments both Jim and Chuck had that uh, it, it's one of those things that kind of kind of get more of a feel for being mm -hmm. able to, to ask for uh, or look at um, the options of, you know, you know, increases over, over, you know, uh, some more increases over a period of the five years. I, as you mentioned, there's a, but if these numbers are 3% or 4%, which all adds up to an additional 1%, getting a feel for that uh, to see if, um, how that, how that, they, how they will feel about that or, or what. Yeah, that's all, that's all back to the discussion. I mean, I think what I got this, and this is why I want to do this with, with the board, because I want to hear where you're coming from. And I think, again, those are all fair points. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the formula that gets used, it's, you know, we could lower from 100 down to 50 calls since that has been, you know, more of the average. That's realistic. But when we started, they were, you know, they were proud that they had just, you know, kind of broken the barrier and got call volume below 100 with a ton of false alarms, but equally, you know, the modernization of the campus was ironically, you know, ahead of them. So in 2012, when we started this, the brand new building that we've used, you know, for gra fire, fire Academy graduations for a drone conference, which was another great collaboration with them, never, wasn't even there. Um, and they built several buildings since then and modernized so many different systems. I mean, they, it's a really, you know, not to blow them up too big, but I have to tell you, you know, the former fire marshal hit it right in the nail head. He said, you could eat off the floor in that place. And it's that, that well run, that clean. So, you know, they've done a really good job and, but we'll have those, we'll have those discussions. I think, you know, that the group that I deal with certainly, um, 
is open, I think, to have you know pretty interesting, you know, honest dialogue. And and I and I appreciate the feedback because I struggled with you know, that myself, but you know, also maybe not wanting to change the approach completely, given you know, like I said, where we are. Rob, Robert. Yes. Oh, Rob. No, go on, Rob. No, I just have. Uh, Chief, has the radio communications improved there? Because I remember when, you know, we first started uh, working there that there were some dead spots and some problem areas. Has, has that improved or is that still the same problem that they're experiencing there on the site? So there's two parts to that. The, the part you're asking about is typically subsurface linac. In the subsurface beam, beam alley, if we were to have an incident in there, first off, they, they're changing it out completely and they're, they're modernizing it, which includes, you know, uh, more robust communication capability. So that hasn't come to fruition yet, but it was certainly on our list of things to make sure that gets done. The second part of that, our own district communications, they've allowed us, and really when I say us, FireNet 6 and the broader, you know, public safety communications um, communication center to include in their site on the hill our communication system. So at no cost to anybody, they've allowed us to add on to antennas up there to boost our district-wide communications. And we've actually also been in discussion, I think it's in the agreement, with a fire cam up there too, so you can spot fires. I mean, they're they're very open to all those things. So to answer, you know, two ways. One, the answer is yes, and it's improving. And the second one is overall benefit to the fire district by being in this agreement and then them helping with the overall communications district-wide, equally a great partner and supportive on pretty much anything that benefits the entire fire district. Uh, to further, uh, just for a little clarification, uh, I, I mean, you, you went around the mulberry bush a little bit. Uh, one, what I'm concerned about is the aspect of the act, either digital or analog, relative to the communications that are there on site. Uh, do they uh, rely on the digital output? Is there an 80211 backup relative to those radio frequencies? Or are we just doing, you know, just a regular basic RF frequency? communications within the uh, site. So uh, maybe I'm not understanding you. You're talking about their uh, system for the subsurface, which is, would be no, our- No, what I'm talking about is the safety of these firefighters that are gonna go on that facility. And, you know, there've been dead spots there because they rely on just regular analog radio frequency. And what I want to try to do is find out if it's any better or if it's still as bad as it was when we first got the contract. Yeah, so I, I think I know what you're talking about now, but right. so let me just answer it this way because maybe it brings some clarity to it. The LINAC, which is the, let's say the beam alley, right, which is subsurface, lot of concrete is always a problem for anybody. What they're doing using our frequency boosters in the LINAC is adding in nodes so the radios will work. They've also, one of the things that we asked for was a hardwired communication system. Indeed. So on both sides, we're trying to improve the reliability and the functionality because whether it was Palo Alto or us, you know, anybody trying, as you know, to get radio frequency through concrete, it's, uh, it doesn't work well. So it can only go so far. And I think, again, probably what you heard was the problems they had in a fire they had probably well over a decade ago. And when we got in there, we immediately started to try and tackle that problem because I did not want that to happen to us. And, and I tell you what, the, the remodel of the, of the LINAC um, Beam Alley with modern equipment has allowed for that to happen because they're upgrading large sections of it. And so, you know, what you're requesting, what you're asking about is part, they're making improvements by adding those nodes in there and a hardwire system. And a hardwire system, right? Right. 
And we okay. asked we ask for that because backup on that, as you know, is, you know, the fail safe for radio is hardwire. I mean, it's, it's the only way it, it works on ships. It works on anything where, you know, as you know, regular radios won't work. I don't care what you do. No, you know, I would just like to uh, have uh, our, what our contractor TEA uh, go in there and do some type of an evaluation uh, of the radio communication system that's within there and have, you know, if we're going to respond there for calls for service, uh, they should supplement our district. Uh, so, you know, for just firefighter safety, you know, relative to communications, even going, going into specific areas there that have these concrete uh, barriers or tunnels or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I would say uh, TEA is very familiar with Slack. And I would tell you that they would tell you if you asked them and feel free to do so, that if it was not for the repeater site up there being used for the fire district, our district wide communications would not be as good or reliable or as robust as they are. Um, they were very happy that Slack agreed to include as part of the changeover, so to speak, that uh, we added that there. And uh, it's been a benefit, whether people know it or not, ever since. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Virginia, Virginia, you had still got a question? No, just a comment. So um, Chuck and Jim, I just want you to know that one of the reasons we wanted to move, the meaning the finance committee wanted to move this was so that we could, you know, get your thoughts and your comments. and. I think it's that the discussion was really good because Harold provided the historic historic context, which I think we have to balance as we move forward with, um, you know, possibly getting into a new contract with Slack, which I think is a good thing. So thanks for that historic context, historical context, Harold. I mean, Jim wasn't on the board at the time, so. Um, no, it's important. Um, and, you know, hopefully everybody sees again, you know, like I said, they, they, they could choose to do nothing, um, right. but they don't choose to do that. So, I mean, I think that's, like I said, yeah, I have to say, and I'm not just blowing smoke here. I've really enjoyed working with Slack and right. they have a very proactive mentality. Um, you know, the only reason they were even able to not have on, on site, anymore was was the people that worked there and how they tackled a lot of different problems believe you me to get where they are to get a tiger team to agree to that that was not that was not easy nor was it easy from the standpoint of exiting or entering an agreement where you had another fire agency uh, that was in there and, and to be fair to palo alto you know they they ended up with that thing because it was originally stanford fire department right under the campus so yeah. you know that that then you know inadvertently became uh, a palo alto contract and you know there was a lot of weird and this is nothing against palo alto fire there's a lot of weird things that nobody ever took on from hazmat to ems that we found were not in alignment with san mateo county despite the fact that geographically to direct mclaughlin's question are in san mateo county i mean including exclusive operating areas uh, where Palo Alto was running ambulances into Slack, there's no except there was no exception for that. So you know, I think we've helped to clean it up uh, in a lot of different ways. And you know, again, I take nothing from Palo Alto Fire; they gave them very good service for 40 years. So Harold, what's your Thanks. next step now? You're just going to go back to them and talk. What, what it I mean, I'll talk about this, and I'll talk about you know increasing costs and everything that we're talking about. And we'll try and balance it. I think that was the key word tonight for me. Right. We use the key word on all this. I mean, balance to me means, you know, we're obviously trying to be fair and reasonable, prudent. Um, we do have increasing costs. We are going to add more resources. And, you know, where's that, where's that sweet spot in there for everybody? Understanding, again, that we're kind of at a little bit of a, a I don't know, maybe the word disadvantage is too extreme, but you know, the, the call volume has dropped and the campus is empty. So, you know, yeah, and I think those are big factors to consider in your analysis, um, Jim and Chuck. So, 
but again we didn't you know make a recommendation as a finance committee because definitely we wanted to hear the different viewpoints but i think that the balance is going to be really important. So Harold, do you got to keep that in mind when you when you talk to them, I think? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you a little fact that I think a lot of people don't know is that, you know, because it is Stanford University has a huge um, stake in the campus, but equally they work a lot together. I mean, John Arriaga is involved in a lot of different ways in both Stanford and, and Slack. But, you know, there's a, there's a building up there that, uh, many times is used seasonally for visiting scientists, but it's a hotel, but essentially it's it, because it's seasonal and things aren't exactly the same, what it does get used for, which generates call activity is it's for the families and for outpatients at Stanford hospital, including children's hospitals. So, you know, I think what a lot of people don't realize is we're actually responding in on, um, people who are out or in, you know, families that are there because they can't afford to be anywhere else. And so Stanford is, and Slack are working together to support those families and the patients up there. Um, and occasionally we end up with, with calls in there because of that. So, you know, everybody looks at it, says, well, that's the Department of Energy lab. Yeah, no, that's only part of what's up there. You have actually outpatients and families of patients living in a building that, you know, they're working in cooperation with the Stanford University and Hospital up there. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, I got a close to nine after nine o'clock. Uh, I'm prepared to stay to midnight. So, um, we either can uh, get him a, a question to ask T. Just, just uh, quick, along, Robert, this line, along the same order, Rob. And then just Chuck. very fast. I mentioned it before. I'm going to vote no on this. Okay. Because I want an evaluation done for the safety of the firefighters that respond to that facility to make sure that they have radio communications. And until we get some type of an evaluation, either from TEA or from even the Slack, can do it themselves. Uh, I'm going to vote no on this. Well, I don't okay. even we, think there's uh, a motion. Virginia, there's no, Virginia. there's no motion on the table, Robert. Virginia, I know. No, hold, well, I know there on. isn't, but it says discuss, and that's the way right. I feel now. We're in discussion mode, Rob, at this point. So we, Chuck, you, we're just discussing. So Chuck. Yeah, I, I have a quick question that uh, Stephen may have the answer to, but uh, if not, I, I was hoping perhaps he could ask. Uh, Stephen, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know if. Stanford's leasing of this property to other uh, groups for which it may or may not receive rent, but I assume the Department of Energy pays rent to Stanford for this property. Does that create a taxable possessory interest? I, I wonder if you know the answer to that or could find out. Uh, I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm happy to try to find out, but I don't know that it would create a, I mean, I do think that it would not create a, a tax liability for the district. Uh, could you explain a little more your concern? Well, let me say, I, I'm guessing that you're probably right. When, when tax exempt land is used for profit making purposes, let's say a hotel, they built a, a commercial hotel on it, but it's not owned by the hotel, the hotel has to pay possessory tax for the use of that property. And it's, it's property tax that accrues to the district. Um, in lieu of that, there are these other kinds of arrangements that are made. Sometimes they're called pilots or whatever. They're where it's, it's in lieu taxes that are paid. I just wondered if we, we could just, for somebody who knows tax law, if we could just find out if in fact I'm not challenging the chief because I think he's probably right, but I just want to verify the fact that we don't have to be paid anything to provide service for that. I just want to make sure that assumption is true. Okay, I understand your question. I didn't understand it before, but I now understand. I thought you were concerned about some tax liability for the district, oh, no. but you're actually wondering whether there's revenue, untapped revenue that's available, so I, or maybe exactly. even tapped. So I, I do understand your question. I'll Thank look into it. Thank you. Yeah, historically, just so you know, because I'll be equally quick, 
So we did include Martha Poyatos at LAFCO. She looked at all that, and we did have legal counsel directly involved last time in the um, negotiation of the agreement, the creation of the agreement, and so forth. So all of them had said, no, there's no, to your point, possessory tax. And when I use the term hotel, they would call it housing for patients. So they don't necessarily, I don't want to make it sound like they got a hotel and people are, you know, from the outside are allowed in. It's very specific what they use it for. Okay. Any other um, marching order for the chief and for Steve? Uh, if not, uh, then I would move on to item number um, seven, which has to do with the discuss and provide directions to staff regarding future retirement liability on the replacement benefit plan. Um, uh, chief? You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I believe we discussed this again with the finance committee. Uh, we had a good discussion and I'm actually going off of what the results were here. Uh, you know, Kathy's on the call, but what I tried to do is you know, take the, the feedback from the board and address the concerns that were there. So if you flip to, you know, you get past the first page, but go to the second, what was the discussion? I mean, anybody in the finance committee can jump in. These were the three things that we discussed. And then, you know, really what our recommendation, I think the ultimate recommendation from the board members was, uh, and we added to, was to have an actuary look at this, but equally uh, go ahead and set up a fund and fund it. Uh, and budget about $100,000 per year, understanding that there are three, as listed below, three primary individuals, myself included, where there could be an issue based upon their election of what they are picking in PERS. Um, and not to suppose what that would be, but all three are married, just so you know. Um, and there are equally, as Kristen looked into and related, but not necessarily still listed in this report, by name, um, there were others, I forget what the number was, I'm looking at this right now, where that could be an issue, but we didn't know if it was gonna be an issue and we have some time before that happens. So to play it safe, it was create a fund, put money in the fund, watch to see what's gonna happen and annually evaluate it and then get an actuarial to do a more in-depth, which I believe was Kathy's recommendation, do a more in-depth look at it uh, in the meantime. And that's that's the essence of the report in a synopsized, hopefully quick and easy to understand format. Open up for questions for the board. Anybody got any questions for the chief or Kathy or Kristen? I see Chuck's got his hand up, but he's on mute. Oh, I can't see him, okay. Can I go ahead? Sure, if you want to. Thank you. Um, this was a, it was a very dense kind of report. It, it, I had to read it three or four times to kind of get what was, what was going on. And let me make sure I'm understanding it. None of this relates to our liability or our our, um, how much we have to pay. It, it really seems to only relate to the accounting of that. Is, is that correct, Chief? I would say that's probably a good way to put it because if you recall, I mean, not to go into the, the last report because we did do a full report on this, but Director McLaughlin flagged the issue. Uh, we did, you know, HR and, and Kathy did, uh, you know, Kristen and Kathy did some extensive research on it, came back, with the PERS circulars, as you know, it was run by Stephen as well. He looked at it and based upon everybody's kind of analysis, you know, that's, that's the summary here, right? Which is, here's what it could be. But we don't know until again, people pick their election and leave and then we'll see is it truly a financial impact at all? Um, so I think the safe play was, and I, you know, I know you've been on the finance committee before director, so you get this. It doesn't hurt to set up a reserve and it doesn't hurt to put money in there just in case, 
um, and then do the analytics. That's why Kathy also recommended to get an actuarial people who you know are expert in this and can actually look at it from a longer term impact. But we don't know what we don't know because you don't know what people are gonna pick in terms of their election uh, when they retire. Again, all three of the primary, myself included, are married. So typically we would, we would pick a survivor uh, preference for how our retirement calculations would be done, which then obviously would lower the amount because it's you know distributed for two people and this would become somewhat of a non-issue for that person. That said, none of that has happened. So there's this still, to your point, potential financial impact. So what threw me off from on the first page, the second to last paragraph says in evaluating the risk to the district. And so I was prepared that there was some risk here. It doesn't seem to me that there's any risk. This is simply a fact and we're going to owe people money for this. And so anyway, it seemed like maybe we were, we had some options here that somehow could either increase our risk or reduce our risk, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Let, let me say, I, I think what, what, what Kathy suggested, I think is a good idea, but I think it's a good idea for step two. I think step one, this is an accounting issue. I think we should be talking to our accounting firm because you've laid out three options here, basically. One is, can we just talk about one year and forget the rest? That's one option. Can we talk about the whole future? Or can we just ignore it entirely and hope it goes away? And I can't imagine that our accounting firm is gonna let us do anything except number two, the one that, that the finance committee was recommending. That is, once we know we've got a liability, we can't say, oh yeah, we owe a bunch of money, but we're not gonna put it on our balance sheet. I, I just can't see how they could allow that. So I, right. I, I think to your, needs to talk to the auditor. To your point, I mean, you know, you're, you're correct. I mean, for every other potential liability, whether it's workers comp, whether it's even the USAR program, you know, we've set up reserves or, you know, ways in which we can cover those. Sometimes they're used, sometimes they're not. Um, and, and this seemed to be, I mean, I don't want to overcomplicate it. It seemed to be the easiest, most straightforward way on something that's, you know, I think it was a good point. Director McLaughlin obviously was concerned and brought it up and brought it to our attention. It, it's got legs, but nobody really knows yet. Right. So, I mean, I think your, your analysis is pretty much spot on and that's why the committee picked the number two option. But I think, I, can I point one thing out? That sure. this is an annual liability. So it's not something that can build up and become huge all of a sudden and be, oh my gosh, look what we owe. So that's why we could do an annual line item for it in the budget or set up a reserve account. Yeah. Yeah, but, but Kathy, I, I, it's more than an annual thing. I mean, it's, let's say I'm just making up a number. It's 20 or 25 years of payments to somebody taken out into the future, possibly escalated, I'm not sure, and then discounted yeah. back to the present using some yeah. discount rate. I mean, th these, these are not small numbers. I mean, it, it could be half a million dollars per person or something. Um, I'll let Kristen speak to that. She did some calculations on it. I'm sorry, you, you, uh, you're kind of cutting in and out. You said you did some calculations? Kristen did some right. calculations. So, sorry, so um, adding it up through the person's lifetime, yes, it could probably be half a million dollars if the person lives. Um, it's determined on how the person, how long the person lives. However, um, the calculations on there were just done for a year and that was done at their maximum benefit. Um, I have talked to a couple people, um, well, um, one of the per the people on the list um, that is retiring soon and um, the amount um, of retirement they're going to be getting is not quite close to that. So um, when I mentioned that it was the risk, it had to do with um, 
it could be a much higher amount than we think it is, or it could be this amount, but it will likely be something lower. So when evaluating the risk, it, or I guess it's not really evaluating the risk, it's evaluating the liability. But um, yeah, this is an annual amount, but it, it will probably only touch these three people. Um, but also um, you had mentioned it could be upped each year, but also the maximum um, retirement would be upped as well. So the amount that PERS would cover would also go up with that COLA. So I don't believe that it would be increased to the, the, the district each year. And we're not talking about the whole pension. We're only talking about the excess amount of the pension, correct? Right. Yes. Um, and let, let me ask you a question. When CalPERS does this, and I don't know all the intricacies and so forth, but, mm -hmm. but somebody has a choice. They, they get 100% they get until they die, and then their spouse gets 50% or something like that. So the yeah, so they, they, they get to choose and then it also depends on their career. So we had a deputy chief retire last year that was highly compensated, but because his um, benefit was split between our organization and another organization, um, he never reached that, that amount um, that went over. So, uh, well, sorry, it was split between our organization and another organization, but he also never reached the full 90%. And um, his election for his spouse after he left was much, um, was higher. So he never even got to that limit. So again, um, we don't know what people will elect. They can also elect to have beneficiaries. So if they wanted to have a child um, or anyone really that they name to receive something after they leave, that would also lower their benefit for the year. Um, so again, it really kind of just depends on what each person elects. So when I put this, I kind of put it at the highest risk. If the person hit, if all of three of these people had elected, um, to kind of give nothing extra after they le left, um, I thought it'd be better to be give a more conservative um, analysis of it than something that was lower and then we have to turn around and pay something higher. So um, that is looking at it very fiscally conservative, but um, probably not likely. Let me ask then, just so I'm kind of understanding the mechanics. Let's just say it's 230, anything above is excess, and somebody gets right. 250, so it's $20,000 excess. That's correct. When that person dies and the spouse gets, uh, say, 125,000 or half of that, is that subject to that same excess also? Or as long as it's below 230, it doesn't count for the spouse? In other words, would the spouse have any excess over? Um, likely that if a spouse is getting over, um, a spouse would not get over um, that limit. So is the limit cut in half for the spouse? That's really what I'm asking. It, it depends what the person um, elects, right? So if somebody elects for the spouse to get 100 or 100% when they, they pass, it is likely that that um, limit will not be fully reached. Um, but that's all kind of taken into account when um, CalPERS does their actuarial on that. Like they'll look at the age of the spouse and how long the spouse is expected to live afterwards. Um, it, it's kind of all, um, I'm, just, I'm not sure if I'm really making it's sense. A, it's a variable, right? There's a lot of variables. Right. right. And, and let me just say this publicly. I'm going to pick the survivor benefit because my wife wants me to pick that. So I want her and everyone to hear, I will not fall into that category because she will get a percentage if I pass before her. So obviously this is very complex and I'm sorry, I'm not, this is not an exam here. So I, I'm just trying to understand what, what's going on. Uh, can I just say though, it, it's to me that we can't possibly be the first public agency ever had to, to encounter this problem, which is why I think the, the first stop in this 
would be our auditing firm, just to ask them if there's any technology, if there's any formula, if there's any ma how-to manual in terms of how to figure out all this stuff before we spend money on an actuarial study and so forth. Do that, yep. Uh, Kathy, you have a question or a comment? Or do any other board members have comments and questions? Yeah, Jim? Robert, Robert Jim. Did, uh, when the Finance Committee uh, considered this issue and you considered creating a reserve account, is the goal to fund that reserve account to the level that earnings from that account would pay whatever the amount uh, is determined to be, rather than, or, or to be funded out of current uh, current budgets? Kathy, you want, you, yeah, you want me to take that one? I mean, essentially, as Kristen said, that number that you see, truly the 91 to 36, 14, was worst case scenario, um, year one, depending upon what the three individuals would elect to do or if they retire. Um, and so that's why the 100,000 and then the, have an actuarial take a look at it and see if this is gonna be a bigger problem. But it's kind of a wait and see too, Jim, because Nobody that's not, really, really Harold, that's not, Harold, that's really not my issue. My issue is, and let's just assume for discussion purposes that it's $100,000 a year. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I think there's going to be payroll taxes that we have to pay on this as well, but that's a, a separate discussion. So just for sake of discussion, let's say it's $100,000 a year. Do we put $2.5 million aside in a reserve account uh, that's generating income uh, to pay that $100,000 a year? or do we pay that $100,000 a year out of current income? Or is this something to be decided later? Could I answer the question from a, a so that comment? Uh, so, Jim, did you want to get an answer from, uh, from Kathy on that? Or did you want to chuck the answer you had? Uh, sure, I'd be interested in, in any informed view on this. Kathy? I, was, I think um, we hadn't delved that deeply into what the reserve would consist of, but I think uh, it was more along the lines of putting aside uh, the amount a year, not necessarily what you said, because, you know, interest rates and earnings on funds can fluctuate very wildly. I mean, it can be done that way, and we can do it at a worst case scenario. I think when a number is seen like, uh, as I read further down that there are, as there are seven additional yeah. staff members that they could apply to. It so I could, think it could, but we're looking at, you know, their retirement date and so forth. And it's, you know, it's, it's well into the future unless obviously something happens, but the three, you know, myself included that were primary. And I think to, to maybe have the answer, and I'm not sure if it's a, the best one, but, we try to take an incremental but aggressive approach, meaning set up a reserve, fund it incrementally currently because we just don't have enough information. And that was what, you know, when Kathy suggested an actual where it was trying to really take a better look at it to see, I think to Director McLaughlin's, maybe to answer your question, what does it look like going out, you know, multiple years and and with additional personnel and i i don't think you know we're, we're chasing something nobody really knows the answer to until we get into it so i mean i don't know if maybe the the phrase the best guess is the way to look at it right now because that's kind of nobody nobody knows but we're trying to do the best that we can and going through the finance committee this was what we came up with so jim are, is your line of thinking is that whatever <clears throat> whatever the number is that we can self-fund that particular uh, uh, through a sinking fund or whatever to th that particular category? Yeah, that, you know, and again, I, 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 that's one alternative, one thing I think we should consider, yes. Okay. Robert, can I address the question? Yes, yes, Chuck, please. Um, Jim, normally what you're talking about is an endowment. <clears throat> That is where you put a, a sum of money into an account that generates earnings to pay whatever you're trying to pay for. 
normally that's not what a reserve is. A reserve is simply what the total liability is and it's something you put on the balance sheet. So for example, let's say it's 100,000 a year, you might take it out 20 or 25 years, what the average lifespan would be of the remaining people. So 25 years for, for at 100,000, we're talking about two and a half million dollars. And then you discount it to the present and maybe using 5%, maybe we're talking about a million and a half dollars or something. I don't know the calculations, I'm just guessing. And you would put that reserve on the balance sheet at a million and a half dollars and, and it would simply be sitting there and it's something you would revise every year, but you wouldn't put enough, I mean, for us to be able to pay 100,000 a year, we'd have to put in quite a large, I mean, if we made 10%, we'd have to put in, you know, a, 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 you know, a million dollars. If we made 5%, we'd have to put 5 million in. If we only get one or 2%, we'd have to put 20 or $30 million in there. So normally you wouldn't fund this with an endowment. Um, it would be it would simply be a reserve which is announcing to people what our obligations are what our liabilities are yeah thank you um, any other comments um, so the, the the where do we go from here because the recommendation is for uh, to accept uh, option number two by staff and then allow staff to move forward with some of their other investigation or research and to bring it back to the board uh, next that with their findings from from next month is that Kathy how you saw it yeah I think Chuck had a good recommendation checking with the auditor um, we could go with that first and then come back yeah, that's a good question. I think I think that is what I would recommend is to talk with the auditors first uh, to find out if they have um, an idea of what others are facing or what the ending calculation would be. Well, I mean, okay, but so what you're saying is do that before we even um, create the special reserve fund. I'm assuming that's what you're saying. Is that right, Chuck? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the auditor would have to bless the reserve. The auditor is the one that's well, well, hold on. So would the, are you saying that you would have to bless the amount of the reserve or just to even have a reserve account? Because the, the, um, most, the recommendation is to create a special reserve account. And so would that, if we had an account that we would create then you know we don't have to put anything in there until we have the auditor take a look at this and you know deal with an actuary to better determine the exact annual liability amount but so i kind of maybe i'm making i'm taking it too literal i just want to be prepared um for you know what we need to do next so if you don't think that we should even establish a reserve account then option number two i don't think makes sense but if you think that we should establish a reserve account and work with an auditor. I mean, what I'm saying is that things can be done in tandem instead of separately. I don't think we have the choice about it. I think we need more information before we decide what to do, because I think ultimately the auditor is the decision maker here. And so I think- No, we're the decision maker. The auditor would be advising not a, us. It's not, not a requirement at this point. What, what was, was that, Kathy? Kathy? It's not an audit requirement at this point to have funds set aside or even recognize a liability. It's, it's not really I'm not disagreeing with you Chuck I, I just want to be prepared you know if we need it I mean I guess we can how quickly could we establish a, a fund it probably not it wouldn't take long at all but do we have to come back to the board to do that for an approval I I mean I think you can you can recommend that now I know one of the um, board goals is to look at the reserves and go through that set up and I think we could put it into that um, board goal to determine the amount we wanted to set aside in the reserve if that were the direction. But I, I, I really do believe we need to um, kind of get a better. You're cutting in and out, Kathy. I, I, don't, I don't know if anyone else can hear you. I am sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. 
Um, I think we do need to talk to the auditors to get a, a better uh, feel for what the, the whole future liability could be. You know, Jim thinks it can be millions of dollars over their lifetime and things like that, but I think, I don't think um, it's as large necessarily as he thinks. Right, but we don't know. We don't know that. So, okay, so then, then maybe an alternative motion would be to just talk to the auditor first before we do anything and not take any of these three and add a fourth option which would be Chuck's option, which I'm fine with. I just want to be prepared, you know, if we need to have a reserve account available, that we have that so that, you know, we're well, I, think, not I think Kristen's uh, analysis, you know, really is, is pretty close probably to what, you know, what it is. Just and so one, one, one point, Kathleen, mm -hmm. I, I think the analysis of this issue that I saw uh, said that we will be paying payroll taxes on whatever we pay the annuitants. So that's that will add to this figure. That'll be another 15, 20%. Well, we'll pay, yeah, we'll pay the payroll taxes on the amount, on the right. possible high side 100,000 a year. Right. Well, so, wait, so, so my only point, my okay. only point, you know, that all these various factors have to be accounted for. And, you know, it, I agree with you, Kathleen, just more information and then we can decide what type of so, so let me let me ask okay. Kathy a question Kathy um, and this goes for the board too is what urgency do we have in making uh, making this decision tonight or even at the next board meeting is it because um, someone I'll let is Kristen leaving? answer that Kristen um, I it, it just depends on when the the, the three people retire um, because that's um, when we'll start getting the bill from the state treasury. Um, and what they decide to do. Will, so. Right. Well, the state treasury um, bill that we'll get from them for this um, will include all the taxes. We will not be paying um, any money directly to any of these people. Um, I do think that it would be worthwhile for us to reach out to other agencies because, um, like uh, Director McLaughlin mentioned, um, I believe it was him or maybe Director Bernstein said that we are not the first agency to do this. So um, there's definitely other agencies, um, I think even um, a bunch in Sacramento that we could reach out to and find out what um, the liability for, for, for people at certain wages when they retire looks like um, in the future. And I think that that could be very useful for us in budgeting this. Um, as well as maybe even sitting down with the three people on this list and kind of doing a um, CalPERS uh, analysis estimate with them to find out um, what their um, elections they're looking at and what that liability is going to look like um, so that we can consider that as well. Because again, it all kind of depends on what their elections are. So if we could sit down with um, at least those three employees and, and get an idea of what the actual um, liability is going to look like. I think that could be very useful. Okay. So, so basically there's no, so then um, if we were to bring this issue back in the October meeting, would that give you enough time, Kristen and Kathy, to do the research that um, based on, you know, research on the issues that have been brought up tonight? Because again, we have three choices, but we could scrap the three and add, you know, go for the motion that Chuck um, suggested, which I think encompasses everyone's viewpoints right now, and then bring this issue back to the finance committee in October and back to the board. Um, so just looking October. at this, I'm sorry, Virginia. <laughs> no, 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 go on. Sorry. I, I'm just okay. trying to think of the timing because I, yeah. I know what the timing going is going to be. Going back to Robert's um, question, question, was the urgency? I don't, right. think, you know, it's not, it's not a super urgent consideration at this point. Well, one of the employees is retiring um, in the next month, so we've got um, 
probably a year before we get that bill. So, or, um, right. What was that? Kristen, not, he kind of cut out. What? Sorry. One of, one of the employees on the list is retiring in the next month. Um, so there is some urgency as in, um, we will be getting that bill in the next year. Next year. All right. But not, yeah. not right. But, but it's not going to be in the next two months. So, so, so if, if we are able to get to it in, uh, finish our process by, by even November, November, uh, we would, that would be a safe range uh, for us to kind of, before you know, before the end of the year. Before yeah, the end for, of the year. So I'm, yeah, year. I'm thinking about the time, the, the time yeah. element yeah. here. Yeah, right. I think that's, that's a better. Because I think it's important for us to, to go through the, the, some of the due diligence, diligence that, uh, uh, um, uh, Jim mentioned as well as Chuck, and so that we can make sure that we are on the right road and we have did our research to kind of other places and, and what are our, what are other options that we may be able to include in our decision. So at this point, I think it, 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 the, the charge should be to uh, meet with the auditor. Um, uh, and I think Kristen, you said there are other agencies that out there that you might be able to connect with. Um, any other any other charge you think like, Kathy and, and Kristen should have? Uh, along? Well, I mean, I think they've taken notes. I don't really think we need a motion, and I think it's just well, it's direction. Not a motion. It's a motion. Right. That's we'll what just, we're trying we'll to just, give. Direction right. of staff. We, we, yeah, we, direction of staff. Yeah. Are you okay with that, Chuck and Jim? Because uh, we were just concerned about the timing. That's why the, these were on here. <laughs> I'm fine with that. I have a question for Kathy, but for right now, I'm, just, I'm fine. So no, more to come. More to come. What was that? I said more to yeah, come. Yeah, more to, more to come for sure. Yeah. It, was a good, it was a good discussion. I think we furthered it from the committee to the point, I mean, again, the auditor was a new suggestion. Other agencies, you know, I don't know it's a new suggestion, but I think that's a valid point and we'll do all that before the end of the year and come back to you. Perfect. Does that work for you, Kathy and that Kristen? Me. What about, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could, I, could I ask a question of Kathy, please, Robert? Sure. sure. Yeah, you go ahead, Chuck. Since we're paying people excess salary and that excess is not earning them any pension. We have to pay, we have to pay for the pension. CalPERS is not doing it. Are we subtracting that those excess payments from our obligation to CalPERS? In other words, when we pay CalPERS taxes, we shouldn't be paying tax on the portion for which they're not going to provide a pension. You mean when we're paying the the employer's portion? That, that excess we, portion. Yeah, we only pay up to the um, limit, the maximum. So on the so formula. We're not, we're no, not sorry, sorry, Kathy, that's um, not correct. Oh. Yeah. We, we um, for, for um, those employees, we do pay the CalPERS um, portion for the people hired before, I believe it's 1996. We pay um, full CalPERS contributions on all of their wages. Um, people hired after, I believe it's 1996, I'll have to look at the report again. Um, they are limited, which is why we only have three people on this list, is they're limited to what their reportable earnings are. Yeah, that's in the circular. You're right, 1996 is the, is the year. Right. So you're saying we're paying for pension, but CalPERS isn't going to pay it to them. But it does reduce our unfunded liability which we would be paying on. Um, CalPERS is taking that extra money and applying it to our unfunded liability. So, so they're not really charging us for it. Yes and no. <laughs> um, I mean, the un unfunded liability is all basically everything that we're, we're paying in retirement in access of what um, both us and the employee have contributed. So if... Um, Yes. So yes and no, if that makes sense. 
Okay, let me just make my statement though. I mean, it seems okay. like you're aware of this, which is good. We should not be paying any pension monies to CalPERS for which they're not going to in turn give a pen, give pension payments to our, our employees. So if, otherwise we're double paying the pension. We're paying part of it to CalPERS, which they're going to just pocket, and then we're paying it to the employee. I think what you're saying is somehow CalPERS subtracts that and applies it to our unfunded liability amount. But I, I would hope that you guys would check on that and make sure that they're not ripping us off for that for paying tax on those excess amounts. Yeah. Remember, and I, ripping us off with CalPERS is a relative term, Chuck. I'm, I'm with you because I'm a super payer. So, you know, again, there's there are certain rules they put in place that benefit them uh, and only them, but, you know, it's it's PERS. It's, uh, it's its own kingdom unto itself. Chuck, is there a um, information that you might you want? Uh, you mentioned something in regarding looking, hoping that that um, Calpers doesn't do that. Is there is there a action item that you want to you think would be helpful for you to 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 the information to get? Um, I think, look, I, I'm going to trust the professionalism of Kathy and Kristen here and just say, you know, please look into that and verify that we're not paying that. And if we are, I think you should make a complaint um, because that it's not fair to be paying for a benefit that we're not, that our employees are not receiving. They do the actuarial calculations, you know, so they're making a lot of estimates on what's going to happen with this employee or whatever to come up with the unfunded liability or the liability itself. And so whatever goes in there, you know, is paid out in one, at one time or another to the person. It's not, it's not going in and then we never see it again and it's, you know, they've got more money than they should have. I mean, they may, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's not we're paying extra and we shouldn't be. Well, the, if we pay extra. The then. best thing that ever happened was we're no longer in a pooling type environment. So, you know, er, you know, as painful as it's been with PERS and the downturn and the stupid things that they did in terms of investments, the good news out of all of that turmoil was that it got rid of the pooling, which was the ambiguity and the unknown and the ridiculous. And now they calculate pretty much specific to each entity. So, I mean, the reliability of information that we can get or have is much better than it ever was before, which is why when the auditors come in or the actuarials do their, their interpretation or extrapolation is much more correct to Menlo Fire than it's ever been. So your questions are bad questions, Chuck. I think, you know, it's down in the weeds, but that's what this stuff is sometimes, right? Okay, um, any other more questions, Kathy and Kristen? Uh, yeah, I, I think you, that you know the direction at this point, right? Which I think is totally reasonable. So when do you think this would come back to the finance committee again? Any, any idea? Before the end of the year. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, I'm done, Robert. <laughs> So if any other questions for Kathy and Kristen? If not, then we'll move on uh, to item number eight. Hey, Robert. Uh, yes. So item number eight will be very simple, but I would like actually, and hopefully Director Bernstein doesn't have a concern with this, but to move, uh, you know, and Steve and I talked about this, I'd be trying to understand his question, which is on the agenda to discuss, to discuss the chief officers management of confidential employees compensation plans would probably be a more robust discussion in advance of what we're going to bring up on an element of that and where we are and what's going on is probably it's probably better to do this in reverse order just to, for simplicity and for you guys to have probably a longer discussion uh with this if that's what it takes was uh, I, it makes sense but what is the board's wishes
I'm not sure what the proposal is. That is the yeah. proposal. The, the proposal, proposal here, item number the, nine before item number is eight. Is to re reverse right. Oh, that's fine. Any opposition to that? Okay, here none. Uh, we'll move to item number, uh, move number nine up to eight and eight to nine. Uh, Chief? Well, it's actually I'm, not mine, it's Director Bernstein's. This is the one that he had asked ah, to be on the agenda. Okay. Right, so I don't, I don't want to presume to know what Director Bernstein is going to bring up, but I know that he wanted this on the agenda, so it's on the agenda. Director Bernstein? I'm sorry, which item are we on right now? I'm confused. We're on item number nine, discuss chief officers and management and confidential employees right. compensation plans. Agenda item number nine. Oh, that's not on my written agenda that way. I'm sorry, I'm referring to my written agenda. So we just changed the, we just changed eight and nine, Chuck. That was so, a course, initial so course. That's number eight right now. That's the flexible yeah. benefit plan. No, we're, right, we're, but you're, that's not the one I made a motion about. Number nine is what I made a motion about. Right. That's why we switched it so that we can talk about what you what your motion was. We're on so, item so nine. The, the, I can help clear by clear, clear this up. The agenda item that you see on your screen already includes the switching of order that the chief has requested. So that what is on the written agenda as number nine appears on your screen as number eight. So the, period, the order on the screen is the order in which the chief is requesting that you take these items. And that flips the order on the written agenda of items eight and nine. So which one are we on? Can you please? Wait. The proposed, we are now on item eight on your written agenda. Uh, excuse me, number nine on your written agenda. Discuss the district's flexible benefits plan and 401A plan. And that's what's listed on your screen at number eight. Hold on a second, hold on, stop, stop, stop. Everybody stop, listen to me. On your screen, we have agenda item number eight, which is discussing the flexible benefits plan. And that is the agenda that you received, emailed from me last week. Agenda item number nine is Director Bernstein's item, which is also on the screen and also in your packet as number nine, and that's to discuss chief officers and management and confidential employees compensation plans. The, the idea was to switch that, Director Bernstein. We wanna hear item number eight, the flexible benefits plan is gonna be heard last. Your item number nine is gonna be heard before. It was just a switching eight and nine. Okay, well, that's what I have on my <laughs> That's what I have on my written agenda that I downloaded. So that's, I've been confused, but number eight is the officer management plan. Okay. So here, here's. No, I, no, number nine is the officer, the chief officers and management. Not, the if number you, doesn't matter. He's on the right. Yeah, item. So it's right there. Yeah. It, so, so I'm the one who's caused this trouble because I suggested a particular order that I think the chief liked my suggestion. Let's put aside the numbers because I share Director Bernstein's confusion over the numbering. The suggestion that, the, that I believe the chief has made, and it was my original suggestion, so I'll presume to know what's on his mind, is that we first discuss an item that is called Discuss District's Flexible Benefits Plan and 401A Plan and Possible Changes to Benefits for 2021. And after that item, we discuss, you discuss the item called Discuss Chief Officers and Management and Confidential Employees Compensation Plan. So that's the order of these two items that I believe the chief has suggested. And that's the order that I see them on the screen right now. That's the order I see them on the screen also. All right, chief, did you have anything to say about the business no, no. platform? No, I'm, I'm working off of discussion with legal counsel. I thought Steve had a great idea. Uh, because it made all the sense in the world to me, but obviously I didn't want this to be as confusing as it's obviously become. But, you know, Chuck, it's, it would be helpful, I think, to hear what your concerns or issues are first, and then I <laughs> tell you we are going to be very quick and simple on the last item. Okay, so uh, the Chief and I are, have, I, I haven't communicated correctly, and I'm, or I misunderstood. So I think what the Chief is suggesting is the opposite of what I just 
thought I said. So right. you should follow the chief's suggestion. I'm sorry that I've made this more confusing. Okay, so we're at, we're on number nine right now, as as shown on the screen. Yes, please. <laughs> Dr. Bernstein, yes. That's okay. yours, Chuck. Okay. Well, let me say when we were in. Um, I don't want to refer to a uh, closed session item, but one of the issues that I, I think AFSME had with what we were doing is they felt that that other um, uh, units, not necessarily bargaining units, had a better deal than they had. And I, 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 I think in a sense they were right, but there's always a timing thing of when you make uh, agreements and so forth. But I, I, I thought that for the next year, since we do well, we, we do these management we do these management plans almost two years in advance. So I'm I'm trying to be mindful of my wording. I think that the plan that we put in place for this coming January, that is three months, four months from now, should parallel what we have offered AFSME, and that represents a one percent increase. I'll leave it at that. Well, let me let me not leave it at that. Just to say, I think we improve we approved January's plan a year ago, and that's why I'm trying to be very precise that we undo or reverse the approval that we did a year ago for this coming January. And in place of that, we, we provide an across the board increase comparable to what we did for AFSME, which is 1%. Robert? Yeah. You know, uh, I've read in the newspaper, you know, for the last several months about uh, adjoining jurisdictions and uh, uh, other jurisdictions throughout the state uh, are actually experiencing pay reductions uh, for both rank and file and management employees. I know we have a, uh, a pay increase uh, scheduled. Uh, I would be interested in a, a survey of, uh, of local agencies, you know, what, what are other agencies uh, doing? Um, I, I think that's, I think that needs to be considered uh, along with, you know, do we stick with what is scheduled that, with the pay increase that's, that's scheduled now so that we can make a better informed decision about whether or not we want to do any modification. Robert, are you still with us? I'm with you. I'm just waiting for comments to finish. I don't, okay. have, any, I don't have any comments. So you, you, I want to make sure everybody got their comments out on the table. Rob, Virginia? There's a motion on it. Uh, is there a motion or further discussion, Chuck? Well, I support what Jim said. I think we, it would be nice to have more information and I think we ought to do something that's appropriate. And I think we ought to be um, fair in terms of what's good for the goose is good for the gander and so forth. And, and uh, so. What are your proposals? <clears throat> well, I, I think it would be helpful as Jim said to get a little bit more information about what um, you know, neighboring jurisdictions are doing or other local fire agencies or whatever in terms of their, their, their management and uh, confidential employees and chief officers. Chief? Yeah. Yes, sir. Is there any way? Are you looking for comment? <laughs> I'm so, looking for comments. And, yeah, so uh, let me uh, let me just say this on behalf of you know staff, and I think 
remember that um, the comp plans were to take the ambiguity out of you know the unknown and put some reliability within the system. Now that said, you know things can change. However, um, I will tell you that you know as I think many of us are reading. I don't know. I nobody knows until the end of the year what the property taxes are going to be. But remember that was one of the things that we were relying on or looking at as kind of a bellwether of how things affected us, right? Property tax. Uh, the other one was PERS costs, which come in at about the same time within, you know, November, December. And then I will tell you um, from what I'm hearing, real estate sales in Athens Menlo Park are at all time record highs. Um, and I'm also going to tell you that what I do know is that last year, uh, per the fire marshal, we had 180 uh, permit requests for fire prevention, meaning buildings. Um, for, you know, there's a variety in there, not completely, you know, full buildings at times, but certainly 180 permits. Uh, we're at a record 240. So we've seen an increase in growth at a time when, to your point, others may be in decline. So even if you were to do comparables with other entities, I'm not sure, again, as a bellwether, it applies to the Menlo Park Fire District. So I would just put that out there as uh, true indicators of property tax, PERS, and uh, activity. Does, does this mean that we have to go out and get a, um... Uh, someone to uh, hire someone to survey this or is that just an internal thing that can happen um, with staff? Well, I, I would this say this. I would say that, you know, I don't, you, you know, you're going to be able to see what the property taxes are. We get given those by the county. Uh, we're going to know what the PERS rate out are because we're given that, we're given that by PERS. And certainly real estate values, I mean, I think there's ways to determine that regionally or within the fire district too. And I can get you the permit information and a more formal report from the fire marshal that we're in excess of what we did last year, um, not only caught up, but have surpassed what we, where we were. So, you know, I, don't, I can't speak for what other organizations have as impacts, but right now, um, I think we're doing very well, and that's a great sign for the organization. So I think you have to take all that into account, notwithstanding um, other indicators you may see around us. But you know, in uh, you know, I would say hold your keep your powder dry, and then let's see what happens uh, in that window that we already spoke about, which is November, December, to truly get the accurate uh, assessment of what's happening in the fire district. I think you look for specific information, right, Jim? Uh, well, yeah, I, I do. And, 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 again, as a barometer of what's going on, but I just want to make the point that I, I think it's clear we could afford the 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 projected salary increases or the the the, the current salary schedule. I, that's that's not my issue. Uh, we can clearly afford it. Uh, given our reserves uh, and, and the projected increases in, in property tax uh, revenue that will come to the district. But uh, we, we are not an island. Uh, and I, I think we have to be very concerned with uh, the um, getting out in front of, of our municipal uh, Partners, uh, I, I think there'll be a price to pay if, if uh, I, I was just reading an article earlier that you, you look at town and country uh, shopping center there in Palo Alto, their revenues are down 60 to 80 uh, percent. We those are real numbers, uh, and I think it would be folly for us to adopt the position that because we can afford. Uh, a pay increase uh, that we should uh, make that pay increase. I think there's so many other factors to uh, uh, to consider. Our, our standing in the community. Uh, we have lots of money now. What about in the future if we find it necessary to float a bond? Uh, 
you know, where, where does that, where does that put us? Uh, uh, there's the issue with Atherton that is staring us in the face uh, with uh, the abundance of, uh, of resources that, that we have and, and uh, uh, that, that Atherton in particular uh, would like, you know, thinks that we have too much. Uh, I think we feed into that. Uh, if, if everybody around us is experiencing pay increases or no pay uh, increase at all, uh, then uh, I, don't, I don't think we do ourselves any favor as an institution. That's what I have to say on that. I'd like to second Jim's comment there too. I never brought this up because of an inability to pay. Could we take, could we pay, we could pay 10% increases, but the reality is that in the next 20 or 25 years, we need to build about $100 million worth of new facilities. And we don't have that much money right now. And this idea that, you know, we can afford three to 5% increases every year, just like clockwork, I, I just think is a, a dead end road. And um, eventually we're gonna have the piper to pay here. And I just, I think it's a mistake. Um, it, we've always sort of wanted to be competitive with what other people were paying. It's not a matter of how much money there is in the bank. It's not our money. And it's not our employees' money. It's the taxpayers' money. And this is money that the district needs for lots of other purposes. Um, and back when we had inflation in the three to five, or not 5%, but maybe three, four, I think it touched on 5% for one month. They, we had large increases and that's when we did uh, our firefighters contract and so forth. But that isn't the reality anymore. When we're looking at inflation, we're down in that 1% you know, area. And uh, I, I just think we need to be smart about this and we need to be fair about it. And it's not a matter of can we pay? Yes. I, I wrote a memo, people will recall, I think that I was saying our, our tax revenues are not threatened for a year or two years. But who knows after that? And once you start, you know, once you continue to pay a lot, it's very hard to cut back and give people a 20% cutback or something. Um, eventually, we, we hurt ourselves by doing too much. And there's just no reason to do it. No reason to do it competitively. And, um, and no reason to do it. There's just no call for it. Costs of our employees are not going up. Why should we do that? Uh, they're not going up more than one percent. I think that's that's plenty. And by the way, I still go back to the extent we have these silly, you know, uh, what do you call them, merit increases, which is banned, by the way, by our our policies. We're not allowed to have kind of just cost of living adjustments, but we that's what the merit increase is. It's a built-in five percent increase. And um, I'm just saying, instead of inflating those things 3% like we're doing, or 2.5% or whatever it is right now, 1% should be enough for this coming year. And that value adjustment is based upon the fact that you think they just make too much already? Yeah, I, I don't, how do we get to where you are without a value judgment? Or what is that value judgment? I'll base that value judgment on the study in the state that showed that we had the highest payroll of any public agency in the entire state. That's not my opinion. That was that was a published opinion. So you value their opinion, in, in, in other words, whatever that report is. I, I get it. I understand. So one of the things I want to try to throw out here, I, I hear what you're saying, Jim. I, and, you know, Chuck, for one a brief moment there, I heard what you're saying and, and agree with parts of it. But I think it gets back to that question that was that was saying was a silly question that was on our goal. It talked about which you know I'm a, it says strengthen employees relationship or relations. Um, it's somewhere in this cadre of ideas that uh, is being thrown out there, uh, I think somewhere there has to be. Uh, a reality check, not only in terms of where we are now, as Jim mentioned, the economics and how how uh, uh, you know where our tax dollars are coming from and where where or, or property taxes are coming from, and, and those institutions that may not be thriving as much in it, in and it of itself, and it, real estate will change hand if that 
that owner side of the sale, it will tell, change hand and, and the, the value is going to be the value. It's just a matter of whether they can make the number work to stay in business. But, but I think in terms of being able to kind of look at a 30 year plan in terms of how and what, what policy would the board need to put into play right now in order to, to help not only uh, if we can provide and if we can't, what, what can we continue to, to try to do? And if it's no, no raises at all for the next five years, you know, bite the bullet and make it happen. But, but I think if we still want to try to, try to, try to strengthen our employees, continue to provide the motivation, yeah, they may be at the top of the scale right now, but, you know, like everybody, once you get at the top of your scale, you always, it's nice to know that when, you, when, you're, you're, when you've been evaluated uh, for, for work, uh, hard work well done, that, that somewhere there needs to be some type of consideration for, for that rather than thank you for and a plaque and thank you for your work and we'll, we'll, we'll hope you, we will see you next year. Uh, and somewhere along the line, as you guys, everybody know that yes, the plaques are good, but also the incentives are, are good too. So that gets back into the overall package that we, we need to probably look at for the employee. And this is just, this is just one of them. You know, uh, we've been talking about, you know, uh, how, how Slack, are we paying, Slack is paying us too much. Are we paying, are we taking advantage of Slack? I mean, we fall in the same category of there, there, there is a balance somewhere. And if the numbers and the information that, that is being asked for is gonna, and other information is gonna, gonna get us to a balance, then yeah, let's, let's spend the money and get the, get, the, get the reports or have staff to look at, you know, look into it. The, the reports and data that we need to get to that in order for us to strike that balance. Um, but just to flat out and say, no, let's not give them anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a supporter of that. So there is a balance. Uh, we just got to find it. So I think at this point, it appears to me that uh, Chief, I'm not sure, or Kathy, um, you know, how soon you can, what kind of information, uh, I think I, we heard from both Jim and Chuck, what kind of information we might need. I think the board members need to figure out, are there anything else that we need to look at uh, to, to, to kind of get it out on the table so all this information be gathered and then we can hopefully come to some feeling of where, where we need to go with this particular issue. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, I mean, November, December is when we get uh, actual data in from PERS and the county and we'll have a good idea of that information. Um, if the board wants us to take a look at something else, I mean, it would be good to get a consensus from the board to do that. Um, but I will tell you, don't forget, and in fairness to the AFSCME group too, because currently there is that sunshine period that that, um, that essentially that agreement that we've come to conclusion or hopefully come to conclusion with uh, was to the end of the year. So, you know, that was not uh, the anticipation that we would go into next year. Uh, remember, we have to you know, in good faith, meet and confer again. And, uh, you know, it wasn't the all end all end all to be fair to them too, but equally fair to other people who are listening on this call that, you know, are in that unrepresented group. Yes, a compensation plan is not a union, nor is it a binding agreement, but it is, you know, it is something that was put in place in good faith. It's things that people look forward to and build their lives around. Is it set in stone? No, but you know, I think then you also have to have, hopefully, you know, good reason. And I think some were listed tonight, whether or not, you know, the employees see it that way or the public sees it that way. I mean, I understand the points, but I also understand the concerns of people that are making decisions regarding, you know, their livelihood and their future and their employment and all the different things that go along with quite honestly, uncertain times during COVID. Um, you know, a lot of people are making a lot of different concessions and arrangements and their impacts to them. I mean, ideally we're, you know, we're trying to work on stability as part of a strategy too, and not 
disrupting people um, who work for the organization based upon, you know, how much they're being impacted and being asked to do at times as well. We got a lot of very dedicated people who work here and, uh, you know, I don't want to underscore their contributions, their benefit, the things they've had to do to even be able to come into work. Um, it's all in play. And, you know, I'm a stability guy. I think you know that. So I don't like to make waves and ripples until there's a reason to do it. But, you know, I work for all of you. So, you know, you tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. But, you know, disruption is just that. It's disruption. So is there any other charge we need to make, give the chief and Kathy and Kristen? Well, per perhaps we could review what that charge is so that we're all uh, uh, have a, a common understanding. Okay, so why don't we, why don't we do this? Um, there were some requests that you made, Jim and Chuck made. Could you restate those for the record? Sure. Uh, I, I know I'm, I would start with the state uh, of California. Their rank and file and managed employees took a 9% pay reduction. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody budgeted for it. And for some of those folks, that is bread off the table. So uh, I would, um, you know, I, I don't want to try to create a list of, of what agencies should we be uh, uh, evaluating. It, we would say, you know, uh, I, I'd be interested, of course, in, in San Mateo County, Pal uh, uh, Santa Clara County, maybe San Francisco. Uh, and I wouldn't limit it to just uh, uh, fire uh, agencies. And we have to remind ourselves that uh, public safety personnel are, are generally the highest paid public employees or certainly in the upper echelon. Uh, so I don't think we should be just considering, you know, other public safety agencies, but, but more try to get a feel across the board. Again, I, I, I haven't done a survey. I'm going on what I've read in newspapers. And, and uh, uh, so I, I would come up with... Uh, you look at uh, the governmental agencies? The, the right. county, uh, county, the and, state... Yeah, a sampling of, of, you know, using a state, maybe uh, those, uh, those counties that I mentioned, and, uh, and a handful of other adjacent uh, municipalities, say Palo Alto, Redwood City, maybe San Mateo. Uh, that, that's the approach I would take. Chuck, your list. I don't have anything to add, but to what Jim said. Yeah. All right. So, um, Robert, for clarity. Yeah. So, and I just want to make sure because I'm not sure I'm hearing this correctly. The IFF contract is not up for several years. That's not in question here, um, and probably should not be since they have an existing MOU. We're not talking about that right because if we're not talking about that then we only have unrepresented chief officers we have unrepresented confidential staff and we have essentially because the um to be inclusive the AFSCME group because we're talking about a whole outside the chiefs we're talking about a whole different tier i am only talking about management employees that we have discretion over okay so not, not covered by no one covered by a contract. Okay. All right. Got it. Okay. Robert, so um, uh, the timing in terms okay, of getting- Rob, Rob had his hand raised. Rob? Yeah. Uh, I would like to make a comment and uh, add something also here. You know, I know Jim brought up the state of California and, you know, supposedly with their budget, they did a $69 billion in the red projection uh, for their budget. And we have, Chief, you could correct me, uh, are, how many special districts are there in the county? Four or six? 
For fire, you have uh, four tour blended. Um, well, when I say that, their Cal Fire has like Coside, and really the only other special district like us is Colma. Obviously, it's a volunteer department, and then you had the Belmont. Uh, district, but that's wrapped now into San Mateo Consolidated. So we're the only one outside of Woodside that's a special district. All right, so it's only ourselves and Woodside are the only two true special districts other than a blend? Correct. Okay. Fire, and, fire, and fire districts, Rob, because there's other districts. Yeah, yeah, I'm in fire, fire districts. But Thanks. in terms of the definition of a special district, where basically our property taxes are the bulk of our revenues. It's Woodside and us. Well, Virginia, may I continue? Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure that everyone understood that definition. Yeah. Well, also the comment that Chuck made that that you just made that we get our bulk of our money through property taxes, and then secondly, all these blended ones depend on hotel tax, other types of tax, gas added tax or whatever. So that's a consideration that I would like to look into also, either a raise or no raise. So those are, you know, my concerns. And I don't know within San Mateo County, other, you know, that, that we are kind of a unique group as a special district. Uh, I would go go into the uh, East Bay and probably Marin too in order to get some type of uh, salary or percentage comparison. Chief. So again, we're talking about for fire districts specifically, right? Of course. Okay, so we're talking but, like um, San Ramon, exactly. um, you know, there's a couple other ones that are out there that we can, Movado, I think that we can look at. We typically, okay. But remember, it's administrative and chief officers only. We're not doing IAFF here. No, 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 exactly. Uh, I just want to give enough of a broad br uh, brush there, you know, to give them a fair shake. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Point of clarification for me, Jim, I thought you, that you, you, you did not want to include um, uh, uh, only fire fire services, but you wanted to include uh, the as I got it, the county government, San Mateo County government, uh, state of California, um, uh, San Mateo County, uh, Palo Alto, city of Palo. I thought you wanted to include. Was I mistaken that you wanted to include those ages, those county governments, rather than? No, I I think, Our I, think if, I think if we look at, at Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, San Francisco County, you know, uh, the government. that would be right. Right. That would be all of their management employees in those counties. And then the other local agencies, I, I would leave it to, to, you know, whether it's uh, Kirsten or, or Kathleen doing it, you know, a, a sampling. Uh, I think we're going to find that, that, cuts are being evenly distributed across various uh, uh, employment uh, uh, classifications. Or in other words, city, if cities are going to cut, you know, uh, fire, you know, salaries for fire department management, they're also cutting them for public works and all the other various classifications that they, that they have. Could be wrong so, on that, but I think so they'd be applying, applying that across the board. So the data that that is being honed in on is uh, information regarding cuts. Um, well, or, no, or did you want to yeah. get a a a, a, a a a what the salary is? If there are any raises that take place, and if there are any cuts to, for the current yeah, year, I, I want to presume that they're that they're just cuts, but rather. Uh, you know, all these, you know, various jurisdictions that are facing, you know, uh, either real or projected uh, shortfalls. I know a lot of them are starting to take actions. So I, I think we'll see that it's going to fall unequally. You know, some they're going to suspend uh, pay increases. Some are actually reducing pay. Uh, and some may be giving, 
you know, not making any changes. I don't want to make any presumptions uh, about what uh, what's being done, but I think that's, that'd be the purpose of doing the sampling. Uh, how are these various government entities responding to this contracting revenue uh, stream that, that most of them face? I think if anything other than a special district, I think you're, you're facing uh, a, a cut in, in your revenue stream. So, so, you know, let's, so let's see what it looks like. So, so it's not necessarily you want to know how much people are making, but, but whether, no. whether there's cuts or yes. increases that's going on. Okay. Right. I would say in those, in, the, in those various jurisdictions, what actions have governing bodies taken relative to uh, salary management salary packages uh, in light of the current economic conditions? Director, right. comparing forget. apples to apples, right, Jim? Not departments, but special districts, because I would not feel comfortable um, comparing, as you said, fire departments that are tied to city budgets, which are not necessarily tied to property taxes, but rather TOT and sales. No, Virginia, I, 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 I think we're going to find again special districts are are insulated from a lot of this economic turmoil. For now, I don't think it's true of cities, county, the state. That they're not insulated. I agree. They're not insulated. So I, I don't. Uh, again, I, I perhaps I'm missing your point. I just want to make sure we're comparing, or that the comparisons, if we go down this path, are actual comparisons. Like we're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. Could you explain what apples and oranges may represent in terms of? Well, the, I think, I think that if we're looking at our um, tax base, it's very different from cities, for example. But I mean, I maybe I'm just splitting hairs. I don't know. I mean, I'm just trying to understand kind of where you're coming from too, Jim. Maybe I'm not understanding. So are you saying that if we're looking at uh, for the city, for example? But I'm kind of, I think I'm kind of, of agreeing Alto, with Rob. So the city of Palo Alto, they, they, they get um, uh, sales tax, they get, um, you, know, pro, you know, maybe some property tax and, and comparing that to a district, like what we get is pretty much our bulk of our money come from property tax. Right, I think our, what our, Rob our, said is, I, th I think, Rob, what you were saying is comparing special districts. Is that correct or not? I think Rob skipped out. Yes, I think that's right. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Just because our revenues come in. I mean, I don't know. I, that's my that's my thought. But I agree, Jim, we're not insulated. I mean, you know, we've got this two-year buffer. So as a the reminder, don't forget, we, uh, we're almost ready to go with a comp and class study. So if you want us to share the scope, uh, maybe that's the point where, you know, some of this additional information could be done by the vendor, but, you know, it depends on how comprehensive, but we were moving forward with a comp and class study because it's due and we want to get that done as well. So now's that, or very shortly will be that opportunity. I think that'd be important, Chief, rather than duplicating the the work. Um, if we are going down that road to for this comp and class that, as an added scope of information, that it seemed like that if if it's necessary, if it's not clear enough on the scope for for the board that that if this is not included, that we should include that. Um, yeah, but I, I think maybe what Jim is even saying is that it's not even it doesn't even have to be as complicated as a comp and class study. Is that right, Jim? Well, let Jim speak for Jim. You know, yeah, okay. A, a comp and class study is uh, uh, is very different than than what we're suggesting or what I'm right. suggesting, which is pretty a, a more informal survey of uh, of the jurisdictions that that I talked about. Uh, and the purpose of that being, as the uh, as uh, we as a board consider, uh, do we want to take any action to modify a pay increase that is currently scheduled? You know, I think we need to to, to hook our heads up and say, what are our neighbors doing? 
uh, you know, what, what are the prevailing uh, winds here uh, to inform us uh, as we confront the decision, you know, do we modify a, a scheduled uh, pay increase for management or unrepresented uh, employees in the district? Uh, it, it won't be, it won't be scientific. It's, I, I think it, an apple to apples comparison would be another special district that occupies the same geography that we do, and, and that's not possible. Uh, so it, th this will be imprecise. Uh, it won't be, uh, it, it'll be imprecise. It'll be, it'll be somewhat informal, but I think it will help inform us as to what are the prevailing conditions uh, economic conditions right now and you know do we for reasons that have nothing to do with revenue stream or, or financial reserves do we want to make a decision to modify that scheduled pay increase President Jones, this is Steve could I jump in uh, for half a second sure. please At, uh, please get a full second so I have a suggestion please um, I, I'm hearing at least three and possibly four different suggestions from the board and to make sure that your staff understands what the will of the board is so that it does what you're asking it to do and understands what you're asking to do. I might suggest that there be a motion and if it's successful a second to make sure that you five are uh, clearly understanding what it is that you're asking staff to do so that staff in turn understands. Got you. So is, can we convert this to a motion so we can at least get the parameters on the table? Because, um, uh, you know, anybody want to take a swipe at the motion? Chuck? Dr. Bernstein, you're on mute. I was saying that Jim made the motion. I mean, Jim made the suggestion. I think he, he really should be the one to verbalize the motion. I, I make a motion that we direct staff to conduct a, uh, a survey to determine if governing bodies uh, in the jurisdictions that I've already named, uh, have taken any action relative to uh, salary and benefits for their management or non-represented employees. So sorry, Dir Director McLaughlin, um, can you uh, repeat what those jurisdictions were? I know that you'd mentioned the state and then sure. you'd- and I'll say that the state, Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, San Francisco County, uh, Palo Alto, Redwood City, San Mateo. San Mateo County or city? City. Okay. Can I ask a stupid question? So Chuck, you also had another idea. I mean, I know we are, we're gonna discuss Jim's thing, but are you gonna bring your idea back up as well? What, which idea are you referring to? I don't recall. Well, when we when you first discussed this and why you put this on. Uh, before we run down that road, okay. let's get let's we, let's get the motion. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's get the motion on the table before we run down another well, the, the railroad track. So, uh, Michelle or uh, Kristen, can you repeat the motion that that Jim just got through making? Because I, I missed some of. So the direction, it's a motion to direct staff to conduct a survey, determine other governing bodies, if they've taken any action regarding pay and benefits with management, uh, employees equal to our management confidential group. And those would be State of California, Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, Palo Alto, Redwood City, City of San Mateo, San Francisco County. Sound accurate, Jim? It is, although I think Rob wanted to include some uh, jurisdictions from the East Bay. Uh, like Marin or Rob, are you there? What, yeah. What jurisdiction do you want to throw in there too? Yeah, I just wanted to throw in because of uh, the uniqueness of special, of special districts that I wanted to throw in only fire districts 
that were in either Contra Costa, Alameda County, or Marin counties. Uh, do you have a quantitative number to go by? You want you to every last one of them? Well, if they're a special district in those particular cities that just deal with fire, I think you know they should be compared. Because they may have, say, for example, uh, Oakland. Uh, well, that's a city. Uh, I would say. So that's why I'm, con I'm confused too. I know what you're saying, Rob. So are you saying only special districts and not the cities? Correct. Right. That's my understanding of what you're saying, which is not what Jim is saying. Well, well Jim would add. Well, we got two different things. Jim, it has his right. own criteria, and Rob got his own. So we just need to understand what the criteria are. We're right. Not value, it's not value judgment, either one of them. No, I'm not value judging. I'm just trying to make it separate in my mind, too, because Rob is suggesting one thing in my mind in the way I'm hearing it, and Jim is suggesting another thing, and the two are not meeting. So they, it, in my mind, those are two very – hold on, Robert. They're two very separate things. So yeah. I'm trying to – and we have a motion on the table, or Jim's trying to make a motion, but by including what Rob wants, that's not what Rob's intent is from what I'm understanding. That's why I'm confused. Uh, Robert? Yes. May I speak? Yes, sir. Okay. And what I want, in addition to what Jim has asked for, I want those special districts that are fire districts to be considered in Marin, uh, Alameda and Contra Costa County to include them, not to have a separate evaluation, but just to include them in our study. That's all. Okay, great. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Thank you Robert. I, I accept that as a friendly amendment. Uh, add Thank, those you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. I'd like to suggest an amendment also, Jim, and that is um, it seems like maybe we should have our constituent towns also that is menlo park east palo alto and atherton uh, that's an excellent suggestion chuck i i would add those to the list as well jim you said you had an amendment i'll second the motion if there hasn't been one i think jim said he had an amendment was that the amendment no no yeah i i i'll uh, accept chuck's uh friendly uh, amendment friendly amendment to add uh, the jurisdictions within uh, the, the three cities within the district. Okay. Michelle? And, and I'm, I'm going to just, to make it easy, not note these as friendly amendments, just as one amendment. Sure. You were still in discussion about one amendment. Let's sure. make it simple. Yes, keep it simple. So, uh, am I asking so, you to read, so read let me that just again? repeat that. Let me repeat all the county, cities, special districts. Okay, so we have State of California. We have Santa Clara, we have San Mateo County, we have Palo Alto, Redwood City, City of San Mateo, San Francisco County, Menlo Park, East Palo Alto, Atherton, Special Fire Districts in Contra Costa County, Alameda County, Marin County. Okay? Yes. Uh, sorry, but just to be clear, we are not talking here about compensation. We're only talking about what kind of cuts they're taking, which could have anything to do with whether it was poor financial planning for any of those jurisdictions, et cetera. You could, no. you could foot, that, that could be footnoted. If, okay. If. So can I add, ask one quick question? Is that gonna include Woodside Fire Protection District as well? If they're in San Mateo County. Yeah, but I just, yeah, I just wanna make sure because San Mateo County could also mean Cal Fire. When I say Santa, to be clear, uh, San Mateo County is the county function. Not That's every just the San Mateo every, County. Correct. Got it. So then so we should include Woodside Fire. Then correct. What's that? Then we should include Woodside Fire. It's our neighboring fire okay. district, and it's the only one that's really in San Mateo County, like ours. Virginia, if you want to add that. Friendly amendment, I'll accept that. So, we'll, but that's that's we need fine. To I just, yeah, then okay. it's, that's logical so, to okay. me. So we need to break here at some point. Yeah. 
So, so um, uh, Kristen, I think the underlying area where you want to see need to have the work done specifically, could you repeat again what you think you heard as to the underlying work? Sorry, so we are just talking about cuts in the area of management and chief officers um, for each of those jurisdictions. And it is um, regardless of total compensation and it is regardless of any errors in financial planning for any of those jurisdictions. I, 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 think, I think the motion reads uh, differently than that, Kirsten. It, it's, has okay. there been any action by the governing board to affect the, the pay or benefits of unrepresented management and unrepresented employees. Okay. That could be cuts, it could be, it could be no action, it could be uh, go ahead with scheduled, you know, for a variety of reasons. Okay. Kristen, you could note that in your findings. Okay. That is a charge. Well, let me be clear, so it, it, it can include increases, right? Sure. Okay. Yes. So decreases Any? as well as increases. Yes, that that's right. That's how I'm. That's how I'm hearing that it. Makes sense. Yes. Any action. Yeah, Any action. Be. That's what Jim is saying. Is that you good with that, Kristen? And and we are clear that it is okay for this information to come from the district and not from a third party. Yeah, th this is, uh, we're asking staff to do this. It, it, this isn't part of the compensation uh, okay. class. Um, so. mm, let's make sure we all know that this is um, something that Jim has now put forward. There has to be a second and, and voted on. Yeah, we, we got, make sure we, we got, we got, yeah, thank you, Kathy. I think we, so we clear on the, what the motion is. Uh, so is, is there, I think, Chuck, did you second or did Virginia second? I'm not sure. I did. Mr. Bernstein. Bernstein second. Um, now, uh, I think we, uh, we finished with the discussion. We should be, I uh, hope that we are. So uh, roll call vote, Michelle. Director Bernstein. Aye. Director Crawley. Aye. Director Solano. Aye. Director McLaughlin. Aye. Director Jones. I uh, sustained. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, uh, Director, one, uh, one last point of order. So I know that we're in here acting like we're giving staff direction, and that's obviously the overall, but uh, for my staff, we'll clarify who's going to do what, because I, don't, I think there were some good questions and clarifications, but uh, yeah. that's, that's for me to do, so we'll figure out who's going to do what and not just presume based upon who's on the call, who gets what. So we'll figure, you, I'll figure that out with staff, okay? Thank you for the Certainly clarification. Clear. Yeah, I, I, I think we I didn't make the assumption that. We well, should. you know, I think there's different things that are in people's uh, general area of responsibility, but there may be things based upon what, I, what I've heard tonight that are completely <laughs> separate. We'll have to look how we're gonna, you know, job shop sure. that or assign it to different folks, so. Sure. Okay. All right. Now I hope I have an easier item on the last one. Oh uh, no. <laughs> I, I hope so. I have number. So what is a number? Are we back at number eight now? And I and I yes. And I know which one I'm I'm discussing here. Uh, Stephen's going to help me out with this, but I wanted to make it you know bring this up tonight as we brought it up to the finance committee. I wish. I wish we were further down the road, but you know what it is, is we're talking about uh, management leave. Um, we're not talking about retrospectively going backwards. We're talking about 2021. We're talking about people's election of benefits and the timing of that, which I believe we still have some time. Uh, the bottom line is we found some issues uh, with Stephen's help, we brought in a specialist. That specialist has met with Kathy, Kristen, myself, and Stephen. And we've had some good discussions about options that the district could take. I was hoping tonight we were going to have something for you. I, so I apologize, there's not a staff report, but to be honest with you, I don't think we're there. Um, the bottom line for me is treating employees fairly. Uh, 
at the end of the day, when you start talking about people's elections, it gets into, you know, and ultimately gets into not only what they can pick, but money. Um, so this is a big deal. Not, not talking about what we just talked about in regards to more uh, or change, but change within the elections that they can make. So the bottom line is what I wanted you to know is that we uh, discussed with the finance committee uh, the potential, some potential issues with this management plan um, and leave specifically and how we're going to tackle it going forward. I don't think we're there yet. I'll let Stephen weigh in, but the bottom line is we may need to either uh, tag along with the proposed special meeting because of the timing of things or create our own separate special meeting based upon, you know, what the totality of circumstance could be for this issue and how it impacts specifically chief officers and the unrepresented confidential employees so that, you know, again, there we're taking into account their issues, uh, which are very real issues and trying to make sure that we treat uh, them as fairly as possible. So Stephen, anything else you wanna add on that? No, I mean, I think you, you're suggesting that we delay this conversation for a future special meeting to be held very soon because open enrollment is soon and these decisions right. should be made in time for the employees to be able to make their elections and open enrollment. So uh, I'm happy to try and answer questions, although we haven't really presented any issues. Yeah. So I'm not sure what questions there right. will be. We'll open it up for any questions. Any board members have any questions or comments, concerns they want to um, voice, Chuck? Just, I, I'm just curious why this is coming up now. Open enrollment. So we've, we've found out again with Steven's help, bringing in a specialist that uh, there's, you know, you have to have compliant plans. You have to do certain things a certain way. And obviously what people pick and who's benefited and who, who wins, who loses uh, based upon what, what we do and how we do it uh, are all very real issues uh, to these individuals. And they, you know, I'm the one right now that's kind of put the pause sign on it simply because I think we just need to do our, a better level of due diligence. And, uh, you know, I think working between Kathy, Kristen, Steve, and uh, Ed, the consultant, we're, you know, we're gonna collectively put our heads together here and come up with a, hopefully a better a better mousetrap uh, so that we treat, again, you know, the majority of employees, if not everybody, as fairly as possible. I'm not going to say everybody may be happy, but I'm hoping, you know, that we're going to avoid uh, things that make them extremely unhappy, um, which would mean losing benefits. And I think that's, that's not, that's not a good solution that I'm, I'm aware of. So we're, we're looking for different ways to try and solve this puzzle. Or is there a timing? Did we, get, did we get bad advice from from a benefits person or from one of our employees? Or uh, obviously, we've had election last year. Yeah, we had an election last year, Chuck, and unfortunately, things have come up. I don't want to get too deep into it, but you know that's why we got a specialist involved. I think there's things that we didn't realize that were in play. Um, to be very honest with you, I'm not sure that management leave is a good selection at all, given what we know now. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> Jim, Chuck, Rob, Virginia? No. Thank you, Robert, no. Steve, is there a next step to achieve? Is there a next step you want to take with this? Uh, yeah, next step is going to need to be, again, either uh, tag on to the existing special meeting next week or its own meeting. And we'll let you know as fast as we can sort it all out. And, you know, like I said, my primary goal is to treat all the employees fairly. That's, that's the bottom line um, when it comes to benefits and people's compensation. So that's Right. I'm working on that. I don't. I don't know that we have a perfect solution. I'm not sure there may be one, but we're certainly going to try as hard as we can to, you know, do that. I my preference, uh, and this is one person's preference, is that the special meeting we have to try to set up for next week has its own life by itself, and 
how many more hours do you want to spend with it, you know, on it, including this. Uh, and you may be ready, may not, but I, I will look for a request a additional special meeting time to just address this, along with maybe some some preliminary work we on some of these other things that we talked about earlier. Sure. Uh, how does somebody, I mean, what is the preference of, of the board? Robert? Yes. I agree with you. Thanks, Rob. I need that this time of day. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long night, huh? It's a long night. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I think I think what will happen is I'll do a survey. Once everything is figured out, I'll do a survey and we'll figure out a good time for a special meeting. Thank you, Michelle. We should have a better sense by Thursday of what I think of, you know, of what we're going to need and where we're going to need it. So, you know, the bottom line is no later than Monday, but I think I'm hoping by Thursday, we got our arms around, you know, a better way. And then we'll know, we'll know to your point, Robert, I'm not trying to take away from next Tuesday's meeting, but you know, they're, open enrollment is starting pretty soon. So we just gotta, yeah. we gotta make it sooner than later once we know. Right. And hopefully we will know by mm -hmm. Monday um, at the latest at this point. Cool. All right. I think the second Robert suggestion also though, I, I think that the meeting next week is related to, it's something that relates to the public and it's an entirely different type of topic. And I'd certainly hate to take anything away from that meeting. I agree with Chuck on that. <coughs> Jim, are you still there? Uh, yeah, I am. I, I I agree. Okay. All right. So, um, message we'll, received. Yeah. We'll, we'll we'll not try and double up. All right. Thank you, Chief. Uh, so we'll move on to item number reports and requests. Let's start off with committee reports. Any uh, committee reports? Um. Uh, 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 finance committee. Any report? No, I mean, pretty much everything okay. we discussed tonight was um, discussed at the finance committee, and I'm glad that we're able to give direction to the staff. So thanks for your input and your patience. Okay, I think uh, for strategic plan, um, uh, planning, I think we have, we went through our litany of things and Jim, I don't know if you have anything else to add, I don't. I, I don't, thank you. Okay. Uh, e prep. Okay. Uh, we uh, talked about the CCM concept and process. Uh, we spoke about the special meeting and we brought it to the board. It looks like we are having a special meeting. Well, excuse me, excuse me, a study session on volunteer groups. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> changing that. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, Chuck, Chuck had uh, emailed uh, with some suggested topics and agendas. And if everyone could like look at that and uh, see what they think. Uh, it's basically what Chuck wrote up was everything we've been, I don't know, discussing, toying with involving uh, these programs and pretty much covers all our, all of the questions that have come up probably within the last seven months, eight months. So Chuck, thanks for doing that email. That worked out really well. Thank well, you, Robert. Anything else, Rob? No, that's just it. Uh, Michelle yeah. came up with a generalized uh, agenda, which kind of fits into a lot of the areas. But there were some some concerns that Chuck had written in an email that I think we should also consider. Um, I think this is probably. Um, uh, I think what Michelle put down was uh, related to what was the motion that was on the table uh, that the board approved. Uh, and I think that's that, like you say, I think some of those items, most of those items will fall into the conversation. Um, uh, only thing that is not, that the chief and I are, will, will, you know, 
have to get together and finish finalizing is is uh, how long the timing of it uh, and, and basically the, the, the real structure of, of the meeting in terms of personnel that needs to be there from our from the staff from the fire district side. Um, I, I know that's one area that you want to the certain groups of marching with their their PowerPoint presentation uh, to to express their their need or their want. But I think the broader question seems to need to be answered first before you can get into distribution of funds. And that is because the, that gets into avenues. Who's gonna who's gonna receive the fund? Is it gonna be each now each each cert group or is it gonna be a 501c uh, C3 group, which is the only one out there is Aston, uh, or will it stay in-house with CCM? Will CCM continue to exist? A CCM, or is there be some modification uh, to that? Um, you know, those those are a host of questions that need to be need, need to be answered before we can even get to the funding request. So, I, I don't know if that was the expectation for the meeting to kind of uh, with budgets and all that kind of thing at this point. I think it's kind of premature, but. You know, uh, I think it, it, it most of what needs to be answered has to do with understanding whether CCM is, is going to be around. And I'm not trying to get rid of it. I'm I'm just saying that does it continue to function as it is? And if so, then that, the part of the function, from what I know when I got on there, was it supposed to be that uh, conduit to the community. If that's not working, you need to ask the question why, and and it really do it do do it really need to be around? So. I, don't, I know it sounds like a philosophical question, but it pretty much is a, a practical means of kind of assessing CCM because it is the entity that I, I thought the board decided to be that conduit to make things happen. And if that's the case, then we need to have more information, I think, from CCM or uh, a dialogue with CCM uh, at this juncture and then at some other juncture Dealing, because the, the EPREP committee, as far as I, I thought, was the entity that will, will get engaged in, in making some assessment around uh, the working with the community to, to work with CCM to, to define these budgets, define those needs, but that process hasn't worked. Uh, so, and I know if CCM is still going to be a part of that, then we need to understand where it's broke and fix it. Uh, if that, Robert, that's the board. Robert, yes, so since I was the one who brought up the idea of a study session. I was not expecting it to be that complicated. Um, I would like to hear what the volunteer groups have to say. I'm not even thinking about the funding mechanism at this time, although I know that's a component of this. I'm not promising people that we're going to give them money. I, I don't know what, what's happening there. What I'm hearing is that they don't, they don't, the volunteers don't necessarily like the structure. So I want, as I think Chuck had in his agenda, I think, if I remember correctly, is, um, is you know, we just need to listen. I mean, people aren't happy right now with their volunteer opportunities they're not we're not getting trained like we did when we were in cert i don't think i mean where there was a concerted effort to do that training you know i think that the structure is something that some volunteers in fact i'd say many volunteers are not happy about i would like to hear that i think the board should hear that i mean i think some of us who are not cert or who are, have not been as involved are are uh, wanting to hear about the structure, what the volunteers are happy about, what they're not happy about, what kind of funding, if any, is should even be out there. I mean, I don't know. I think Chuck's agenda is saying, you know, that it has that we should be listening is probably the most important thing. I, I don't understand why there's there seems to be like this muddling mudding of the waters, when to me it's it's very clear that the the volunteers are not satisfied and i don't want them to feel like the district the fire district wants to separate them from us which is the exact feedback that i have gotten before in one of the ccm meetings 
So, you know, I'm not here with any agenda about we should give this group money or that group money. I, I don't, I want to hear what they have to say because they are clearly not happy with the CCM structure. And they, in fact, in the meeting, everyone was telling me, you know, this is, we're CERT. And in fact, the other day, one of the volunteers said, please stop calling this CCM. It's not CCM, it's CERT. None of us want CCM. Okay, so I don't want to muddy the waters. I want to hear what they have to say because we don't want to lose our volunteers and we don't want them to feel completely disengaged. Okay. At least I don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments, um, ideas? I'd like, to weigh in. I'd like to weigh in on this too, Robert. I, I, think, oh, yeah. I, I think that's right. I think that um, uh, I've been criticized for being critical of the district's support of the volunteers in the past, but I think we have not done a good job for the last five years. And I'd like to hear what they would like to, I don't know how we can have a discussion about something. And I hate to say this, I'm not, I don't even know what the district would say, but I think the district just needs to shut up and listen. I, I mean, and not say what's gonna happen because that puts the board in the position of saying, well, the district said this is what they're gonna do, but that's not what the district's gonna do. And then we make the district look foolish. I think it would benefit everybody if we just kept our mouths shut, listened to what was said, understood what was said, and then somehow got a plan to deal with what we learned. With them, with their input too. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that, and, and I think that when we go into this meeting, we need to be very open-minded and not say, oh, well, there's this, we've done this, or there's this agenda. I don't wanna hear about our agendas. I wanna hear what they want because they are clearly dissatisfied, which is the reason I'm involved with this right now. Our representatives have put out so much misinformation. It's just, it, it's really embarrassing. Oh, you have to be a 501c3. Oh, you have to be a VOAD. Oh, you have to be a COAD. We should just be quiet about all that stuff. All that's just little technical things. None of that matters. Let's just find out how we can build a, a vital, vigorous volunteer organization and what the district should do. And uh, who knows, we may end up doing something we've never thought about before if we just listen. Rob, totally agree. Rob, Jim, you got any comments? Well, as I said, um, Chuck, when he put out that, that one email before our meeting, basically put out there for the seven or eight or nine months or whatever we've been meeting, the frustrations that, that we've been trying to pull out of not only the staff, but I've uh, spoken to and have met up with some CERT and CCM members. And that's why we felt to bring it to the entire board to make it uh, a sounding board to let them express their frustrations to us as a fire board, because we work for them. And uh, Chuck and Virginia make excellent points where we've got to hear from these people. And, you know, thank you, Robert, for, uh, you know, setting the, the sounding board up for a special study session on this. Well, the board set that up last month. So I'll, I'm just trying to be obedient to what you're trying to, trying to accomplish. Uh, and I think, everybody, I think all the staff is trying to do that because there is a, a breaking point that we need to kind of get beyond. So, Jim, you have any comments? I, I do not. Yeah. I, I, I'm in agreement with what I've heard, and uh, I, I agree that uh, we need to do a lot of listening and uh, consider possibilities. Okay. Um, any liaison reports? Uh, hearing none. Uh, reports, requests uh, of directors. Michelle, do we have any? I don't think we do. Director Crowley's raising her hand. Uh, Director Carly. I just want to um, commend the staff and you, Robert, for finally getting this meeting set up. So, I mean, I know that 
it was made last the request was made last week and i think people were like oh when is this going to happen when is this going to happen i'm glad it's finally happening i think that the public deserves to and the volunteers deserve to hear um or to have their say and to give their ideas so that we can move forward with this I... okay um thank you for your comments um Last thing on the agenda is board president report. Um, I think we have talked about all the things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the chief and I will be uh, um, working to, we've got the meeting set up for the special studies and then we'll be sending out the uh, uh, notifications. Um, uh, well, I guess we got the notification already. Uh, We'll, we'll be sending out the um, notification about uh, out to the public uh, fairly soon this week. Right, Michelle? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's all I... I... Have a question, Rob, uh, Robert, about this, just to make yes, sure. Um, Michelle, do we have to change anything about how we're using Zoom to allow the public to be more active in what we're doing? Could we make it just a public meeting and not have panelists and attendees, for example? Um, you know, I'm gonna have to talk to Steve about that. Uh, okay, we're happy to talk. My answer will be you could do whatever you want to do and whatever makes most sense to encourage and allow for public participation. There's no legal issue the as to the distinction between a webinar and a regular meeting. It's a, if that's the case, then I don't, I mean, can we not just do it the same as we have been and we allow public comment and they can talk for however long you decide, 10 minutes each or whatever, whatever you, or however long they want. I don't know how you want to regulate that. What do you have in mind? Well, I think that there needs to be some structure to it because we got some people speak a lot and some people don't. And I think we need to set time limits. We need to look at the agenda, set the time limits and uh, within the structure. Because we can either say, oh, we got 10 minutes, and, you know, uh, you know, or we can say each each area, area we want to try to cover is an hour. So how long do the board really wants to be at this meeting? Is as long as it takes? So be it, we, we can figure that out too. But there has to be some structure in terms of time because uh, you know, at, in discussion at the, at that point in time. So, um, yeah, Robert, um, can I ask a question? You bet. Yeah, we got uh, this is the last go around yeah. on questions. Uh, I prop. Uh, this is to Stephen. Uh, Stephen, would there be a way that we could actually have uh, I don't know cord off the parking lot over at station one and actually, you know, have these people, uh, I don't know, keep the six feet distance and everybody masked up and, and have some, some type of like a, a real meeting where we can actually, I can't say interact, but do some personalization relative to Zooming or are we required to still Zoom? So this is perhaps worthy of a whole separate discussion, but you're not required to Zoom. You are required to comply with health orders regarding public meetings. And you're also required to comply with the Brown Act as amended by the governor's order. Um, so uh, it's not so simple to answer your question. It depends just really on what the county health order would be regarding the nature of the meeting that you're looking to have and whether you would allow folks to Zoom as well as not Zoom or you're going to require people to show up in person if they want to uh, meet, in which case having a gathering in public uh, raises some significant issues with the county health orders. Looks like the chief is uh, is looking to weigh in, but I think you're going to have to follow those health orders as you're okay. leading. No, I'm Leading just. Uh, no. Yeah, no, because you know, there's there's been so much back and forth, back and forth, relative to this, and you know, uh, that's fine. Thank you, Stephen. I, I'm I'm just trying to make this a little bit more personable. Yeah, well, I, know we're I mean, all, I agree. We're all, we're I all agree with that. To together, I, I'm looking forward to seeing you in person, which I've never even ever done. So, I, I totally get it. 
I agree with that, Rob. I mean, maybe the warehouse in East Palo Alto, it's big enough, but you know, I want people to be safe first and foremost. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. And well, you're going to need 50 people. You're going to need to change the day. You have to do temperature checks. We have to. Yeah, that's in. the problem. You got to sanitize the bathroom. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. a long list when you're doing face to face. We just did this with the chiefs meeting just for a group of 10 people. Trust me, it, it's not as easy as it sounds. Right. It, it can be done, but the variable here is you don't know how many people are going to show up. So right. as much as I hate Zoom, because I do hate Zoom, um, and I like face-to-face -face like you, I, there's, it's a bigger deal. And I wish it wasn't, but it just is. Yeah. Thank you. I give up. I agree. <laughs> I agree. No, I agree. I give up. Okay. So... It might um, be easier for people to zoom in too, especially for people who uh, don't want to be exposed, Rob. I mean, I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, but I think from a safety standpoint, Harold's right. We have to sanitize big time. So I just, I just looked at the latest county order. You're still under a restriction that a, a gathering of over 50 people is okay. prohibited okay. flat, yeah. plain and simple. So unless you're going to limit the public to less than 50, it's okay. just... You can't do it yet. I'm so oh, sorry. Stephen, Stephen, thank you for the answer. Yeah, okay. You're well, this, this interim, uh, president report uh, uh, call for public comment number three. Do we have anybody, Michelle? We do not. Okay. A call for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Rob, one motion. All second. Virginia, second. Uh, any discussions? In the hearing none. Uh, roll call. Uh, Director Bernstein? Aye. Director Solano? Aye. Director Crawley? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. Director Jones? Aye. Motion is passed. We are now adjourned. Thank you very much, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And before Bye. midnight. And before midnight. Oh. Bye. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Thank yeah, let's you. Let's party. <laughs>